Greetings and welcome back to a long-awaited discussion, namely discussion with my good friend, Sir Novak. Waited for this for a long time, and uh, on top of that, it's been a while since I've had a two-way talk. I know some of you enjoy those. But today we're going to be talking about dysfunction and the coming apart of society. So in and of itself, not a new topic, but I think we might be able to touch upon certain angles that you may or may not be familiar with, and in general have a productive and hopefully fruitful conversation, although neither of us, I suspect, would claim that we can save society. But sometimes it's important to nonetheless observe these things, note them down, and who knows, maybe, just maybe someone will profit from it. So, so Mr. Novak, Sir Novak, it seems to me that the general consensus, say, from academics, say, Stephen Pinker or similar such people, is that we've never lived in better times. And, you know, nominally that seems to be true. Superficially, things are going swimmingly, it seems, right? Never have people uh, had this degree of luxury in human history. Never have they had this degree of access to food and plenty. And yet, a cursory look but no, uh, pardon me, a cursory look below the surface seems to indicate that Indeed, there's a little bit more than meets the eye here. And you happen to come from a part of the country in the United States that uh, has seen a little bit more of some of this dysfunction and coming apart than a lot of other places. Your experiences here are very valuable. So I think it's best we start with the general dysfunction we can observe in gender relations, which is pretty notable, I think. Everyone would acknowledge it. It's been a major focal point of my channel. When you look at the landscape right now, where you are, what do you see? Now, I I know you haven't, well, essentially you've renounced the the, the dating landscape as far as I understand because, well, it's a disaster zone. Would you maybe expand upon that and why you think it's a disaster zone? Sure, absolutely, and thank you for having me back. It's been a while. Um, I am from the Midwest, and things aren't well here uh, across the board for, I would say, a vast majority of people. When it comes to my own personal situation, yeah, the uh, the dating game isn't great. I think a lot of people in your audience already know that. And when you look at kind of the new way things are working out between men and women, the different requirements, the greater amount of requirements needed to sustain some sort of functional relationship long term, it really puts a lot of people out of the game. Uh, for me personally, yeah, I, I haven't really been interested in dating anymore it's been many, many years, almost 10, actually. And You're, you're 33 uh, now, right? Observed, what's that? You're 33 now, right? 32, yeah. 32, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's been since my early 20s, and since then I've just kind of watched the landscape slowly erode into a, a wasteland of uh online you know online dating uh, i've watched younger people continue to just basically run in different directions in how they see and perceive what relationships should be i think we can all agree social media is not helping and yeah i, I would find it uh uniquely bad in the midwest um for a lot of reasons one is um you know there is there is an there's a lot of decay in rural america let's just be honest about that a lot of people are fleeing to cities so there's kind of a uh, compounding effect as time goes on where options are more and more scarce but as i'm sure we'll talk about further in the discussion a lot of different things are kind of breaking down at the same time and that's really creating a lot more uh tension and a lot more uh, frustration for men and women in trying to create a relationship, and I'm no different. Yeah, there seems to be sort of a veritable laundry list of requirements, mostly on the part of women. It sounds biased, and perhaps it is, but it does seem that a lot of guys would be content with a well-behaved, decently kind, and not obese, okay-looking woman at this stage. And conversely, yeah. women have a laundry list that is just sort of endless, uh, they're by nature extremely picky, pickier than men, and this leads to a lot of confusion and dysfunction. But wh- what was the sort of the watershed moment, if you might share, in your life that really made you aware that gender relations are not the way they used to be and probably never will be again? 
Sure. So I, I am guilty of dating several single mothers and, uh, a lot of it came from what many would just see as like just bad advice from your mother, you know, and, 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 and the females in your family growing up where you, you know, you got to step up and, um, <laughs> it's not really baggage and, you know, it, you, they're more mature and they're more ready for more serious relationships. And, uh, no, that's not true. It's just a, it's a whole other bag of goods that create difficulties and frustrations that are pretty much insolvable i mean the kid's not gonna break up with his mom right so you got to deal with it and the difficulties that i really dealt with came to a head when i was in texas for school um i had dated a woman who had a child i was very fond of her um, and very fond of their of her daughter and it ended up, i ended up kind of being a homewrecker stardust it was it was it was i ended up finding out she was married I contact or the husband contacted me and I just felt like complete dog shit. I mean, what a, what a, ter I, this is the last thing I'd ever want to be. And I didn't think a woman would actually do something like that, bring me into her life her child's life and then hide a very dedicated father who's trying to actually keep the marriage together. And, and just this, all this juggling and all this deception and lies really came to a head. And, uh, eventually I actually testified for the father, um, at, in divorce court and he got custody of the child but two years later i come to find out that he ends up getting back together with her after all of this and it's kind of when i realized like you know uh, from that experience i realized like okay everything i've been told as far as dating is concerned might be wrong i mean that situation isn't probably relatable to everyone but a lot of people seem to have uh, relatable experiences in terms of deception and lies. And so that was when I kind of realized the dating market isn't what uh, I was told. This is not like the 1950s anymore. We're recording and everyone's <laughs> so innocent. Uh, technology has just really blown blown the lid off and how, how we interact with each other. And between that and different luxuries and just, I guess, the paradox of choice i think you would call it just there's so many options mm -hmm. and there's so many ways that you're not tied down anymore that yeah you could pretty much do what you want and there's not any social consequences everything's been kind of eroded away which is why uh, a married woman can uh, cheat on her husband have her child removed for the infidelity and other things that i can't bring up but then get back together with them and i'd imagine a lot of it comes from a desperation from that man to want to keep his family together. But I think the, the larger issue that we're seeing is just a, a qualitative decrease of, of how people are these days, especially in the United States, uh, coupled with increased and probably unfair expectations. And so, yeah, that, that would be when I kind of said I had enough and washed my hands of it. Um, as far as watching the younger generation attempt to date and attempt to do it successfully it seems like a smaller and smaller percentage of them are actually doing it successfully and many seem to have just opted out altogether which i can't really blame them yeah so you were hoodwinked by this woman for a significant portion of time unbeknownst yes. to you and you ended up doing the honorable thing and you are one of the most honorable people i know so that doesn't surprise me <laughs> testifying against her in court but you know, the problem with that story is that it doesn't surprise me. You know, like, I think if you had told that story to someone 50 years ago, they would have been shocked. I think most people hearing that story now would think, yeah, it's pretty bad, but, you know, it's like kind of par for the course, right? I mean, it's not that crazy. I, I think I've told you before, and I think I've told my subscribers before, when I was in South Korea, I had a relationship with a woman for over a year. And she was engaged the whole time. I, little known to me, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought it was something serious. Uh, and she made serious claims to me, and I thought, well, okay. And uh, it turned out I found out as a secondhand information that she was actually engaged. I don't know how the cat got let out of the bag, and I confronted her, and uh, she did a lot of doubling down, double speak. You know, and ultimately, it was, you know, she said, well, you know, you're you're the person I love and I'm more passionate about, but, you know, the other guy, he's more reliable and he's more of a, like a workhorse provider type. She ultimately settled down with him and 
got married and had kids with him, as far as I'm aware. But at the time, that was kind of kind of unusual. This was in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you hear that now, it's just like, meh. I mean, it's, it's just sort of, I don't find anything in this realm, or other realms for that matter, but really this realm, very surprising. When you hear about horrible behavior of human beings, specifically women, it's sort of, eh, yeah, that's the lay of the land, that's how it is. It's yeah. terrible what you went through, undeniably, and it's incredible that you did the right thing, and I, you know, how much respect I have for you for it, but it's, it's not really surprising, um, because ultimately it's the culture that allows this, right? It, the, the culture allows for this, this kind of looseness, the, the lewdness, all this. If we were living in a culture that were, frankly speaking, stricter, more conservative, which probably ultimately is a better thing, not because I personally am very conservative, but you know, we gotta be honest, would that type of behavior be tolerated or even excused? I think not, because women are very receptive to social signals. Mm -hmm. If the whole world is sending out social signals that they think are one way and that means, well, you, you can do that. You can leave your husband with the kid and get together with some other guy. You can be engaged and have a relationship with another guy and then lie to him. And that's, that's okay. I mean, ultimately, we've lost the concept of limits, right, when it comes to this, in, in my yes. humble opinion. Anything goes. Uh, there's some pretty nutty stuff, for example, going on with Destiny, the streamer, right now. I was I just to... about to bring that up. Yeah, that's right. I don't want to go into too many details on that, but <laughs> because I'm not really a gossip monger, but it, it is unsurprising that in an open marriage where they both could partake of the carnal pleasure of others and that there would be some kind of issue arising. It's not to say that and there are plenty of issues that arise in normal marriages too. Uh, let's be honest. Sure. We got to be intellectually honest here. But the kind of weird dynamics that are described through hearsay and, and through the gossip, uh, the grapevine, as it were, they're not normal or normative. Although increasingly they're becoming normal. And the problem is, and something people often forget, people tend to think about politics or the culture of politics as its own sphere, but. Mating has its own ideology, and mating has its own ideology throughout the ages we've existed in, depending on the era. Um, we, at this point in time, the technical term, there's a researcher calls it this, uh, we have sort of confluent rom romance. So that means like people get together and they see what the other person can do for them in a very sort of mercantile way, and if one person's keeping up, the other person's keeping up, you stay together, and if not, that's it. And prior to, prior to that, you had a long history of sort of romantic love, also religious-inspired love. And you go far enough back, I've mentioned this on my channel, you get in the agrarian age, uh, agricultural revolution, you know, men clubbing other men to death and just stealing the women where you get these ridiculous uh, asymmetries and reproductive rates. And so, so mating ideology, for lack of a better phrase, is really important. And the mating ideology now doesn't even have a really good definition overall. Like, what? Ex yeah, what exactly is Destiny doing? What exactly was your ex doing? What was my ex doing? It's not exactly clear. Um, and I think this is the problem fundamentally. We're going to talk about other things related to this, is this sort of anything goes. What is the, because mating ideology is important. Without people reproducing, you end up having, well, nothing, and then you have no society. So it is relevant. What is the yes. mating ideology of today? It's just, I, I really find it very amorphous hard to pin down, and I, I don't really know. Uh, it, it, and and the, the problem fundamentally is, as you pointed out when you were speaking, there's, the scraps are so, so few and so petty and so, well, undesirable that what's the point even pursuing that? It's not like we have masses of people in healthy relationships or even just relationships trying to work things out and figure out, you know, navigate difficult terrain together as we have this huge dearth of, of acceptable partners for, for women because of their pickiness and hypergamy, and men can't get anything, which has given rise to only fools, as, as the better bachelor refers to it, or what have you. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's not entirely clear who's at the steering wheel here, other than what we see is chaos and, and really human destruction. This is... This is not good if you want to have a healthy society. And people are very unhappy. 
And what's the point? I mean, what's the point of pursuing anything at this stage? The only people that seem to manage to do this are sort of religiously inspired people like the distributist. And I wonder at times how serious he is about his convictions because some of his statements are at times very outlandish. But um, you're a retired Catholic yourself, uh, I should indicate. Um, That's right. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is human beings need some kind of guidance in every aspect of their lives, every domain. Mating ideology, however you want to mating culture, there needs to be something in place that's actually functional. And it seems like we're trying to re- we've tried to rewrite the wheel. These days, a lot of normies, especially on podcasts, they acknowledge finally that you know birth or human birth control might be the most important piece of technology ever created because it's fundamentally changed everything. Yeah. So, I think without human birth control, none of this would have happened. But we are where we're at, and there doesn't seem to be a, a good strategy because we're, talk, we're going to be talking about at least quite a bit. But listening to somebody like Ben Shapiro with his you know twenty <laughs> gazillion miles per hour voice and his annoying, irritating voice, mouth off about how doesn't doesn't help anybody. Not really. Um, I don't think he really cares. That's a separate point, but which we will address. But yeah, th- there's no guidance, um, and this kind of bleeds into the, the sort of the main topics. This this dis- disconnect that we have observed now, and much more so than in earlier times, between the different classes of society. Now, a lot, not a lot of people like to talk about class anymore. Uh, understandably, I mean, as in we get, we can trace back the reasons as to why. But you look at mm-hmm. The most functional people in society, which I refer to sort of the new elites, they get married, their marriage is relatively stable, they tend not to have a lot of mental health issues, they're typically quite smart, correspondingly they have enough education, quite a lot of education at times, they have some children, these children are, you could say, very case selected, they're raised in a good household and they get all the benefits and blah from genes to environment and blah blah blah, and then you have across multiple demographics in society, just a, an ep- a scourge of single parenthood, which is just proxy for single motherhood. Everyone knows that. It, the the yeah. numbers have been increasing across all sorts of demographics. Of course, it's worse in the black community. It's quite bad in the white community. Even Hispanics, who are usually you know rigorously Catholic, are, are affected by it these days as well. And I think this really needs to be talked about. There's actually a book that uh, some academic whose name escapes me at the moment put out called the two-parent privilege. She's one of these new elites, by the way. And oh, she just points out that... No, and she's sympathetic. I mean, she's pointing out that this mm, is really bad. Okay. This, this is really bad, what's happening to the middle class getting hollowed out and, and everyone else. And this, of course, ties into things like, you might have heard of uh, Rob Henderson's sort of luxury beliefs about, yes. you know, Really, any any luxury will be like, you go, girl, you do whatever you want. You literally blow through your 20s, no pun intended, uh, doing whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, um, just girl boss and yas clean it up. Yeah. yeah. But his famous example, this is how he, he, he has a fascinating story, which is, I think, deeply related to this. We can, we can uh, pick that up in a bit. He's coming out with a book. I mean, he's, he was an orphan. He was a foster child. I mean, by the, the nape of his neck or his IQ and his, his cognitive abilities, he managed to escape. But... He came up with this example because he, when he was at Yale, he got a full scholarship there. He said he, he met all these, and I think the 2013, 14, so just before um, the Wokarati really became a, a force to be reckoned with. And there were these people talking about feminism, this and that, and how women should have all those opportunities. And, and then he would ask the same, these self same women, oh, so, so what are you planning on doing after you graduate? And they would say, well, I'm going to work for a little bit, and then I'm going to find a husband, and then I'm going to have kids. They're like, Oh wait, but you just said that you're gonna have adventure. That, weren't you saying that women should be adventure? Well, well, not not for me, but I think all <laughs> women should have this opportunity to be as free as they want to be, and blah blah blah. And this luxury belief complex is, well, it's kind of destroying society because people need guidance, especially the people that are unfortunately. Not all of them, but not as well off cognitively, psychologically, and, and for that matter, in terms of wealth, as 
these these new elite that are emerging that are still highly functional um and this is the fundamental we can't have a discussion about this i mean for one this idea that people might need guidance is sort of seen as patronizing and well yeah why would you even suggest that you know right Even autonomy which in itself is a problem i mean if you believe humans are highly autonomous then uh I uh, have Both several bri- I have several bridges stuff. to sell you sell you many bridges in fact I have over 100%. 20 um and, you know it's nice that an, a, the occasional academic talks about these things but just as we're not really able to affect change academics in as much as they're sincerely interested in in, in care I mean I have a, a healthy bit of skepticism towards that proposition to be perfectly honest um they can't do much either it seems that culture kind of evolves on its own almost mindlessly due in large part to technological developments. And like I said, we wouldn't be here without the pill or birth control. So that was a sort of biological cultural intervention, but it's changed everything. I mean, people, I'm not the first one to point this out. You're well aware, but before the pill, sex was inextricably linked to reproduction. And if a woman were knocked up, the guy was culturally if not legally mostly culturally at least in the context of the u.s obligated to marry her and and, and what have you i mean these were right. sort of time honored traditions uh, old shotgun was, wedding yeah yeah because out of wedlock children i mean first off they do worse we know statistically you know children out of, outside of marriage but also just that that was just the convention and no one thought to question question it because it was Ultimately, everything was kind of a little bit gynocentric, but of, of benefit to women. You know, the guy who knocked you up is forced by the fo- cultural forces surrounding him to to take uh, quote unquote responsibility. Uh, it's not a term I would right. ever use in a serious way because you know my takes on that. But nonetheless, um, that's what happened. And then with women being able to quote unquote take responsibility for their own reproductive uh, endeavors, that obligation was lifted from the man, and so. That's where the fun began, and this has been. We've been talking about this on this channel and other channels for over a decade now. But I mean, you mm-hmm. want to see a precipitous, um, well, not so much a precipitous drop in marriage comes a little bit later, but a sort of a, a rise in divorce. I mean, look at the seventies; it's nuts. It exploded just seems like right exploded. after no fault. <laughs> yeah, but no fault coincides. Where it all is tied into the pill, ultimately. Not everything. I mean, most of it, though. Largely. Yeah, and this this is the problem. We don't have a cultural framework for for mating anymore. It's sort of I mean the the framework is being sort of made by sort of almost here, here's a here's a nice catchphrase. What are traditions? Well, traditions are experiments that worked, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. We had experiments that worked for a long time. And then for the record, and I'm sure my subs knows, I'm not particularly conservative. I, I've said this many times. I've kind of, I've always been kind of centrist. I've been pushed to the right only because of the, the inanity and the insanity of our time. But the experiments worked, and we decided to somehow reinvent the wheel because that's what we always do. We invent things, we chuck it out in the quote unquote free market, and then we see how it goes. And you can't uninvent these things. You can't just retract them, pal. Yeah. It's, it's a, no, we're not getting I, rid of the, the birth control anytime soon. So, no, and there's a lot there to talk about. I mean, going all the way back to the beginning, when you were, were talking about dating dynamics and having some sort of uh, guardrails to help guide people into relationships and 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 dating and pair bonding, like these traditions might look a little crude, might not be your cup of tea, but they did work largely, and it helped keep you know. The social fabric somewhat woven but now especially now more than ever everything is a free-for-all it is a anything goes as you say uh, quite pointedly and i i the problem is and it's in reference to everything else we're going to talk about is the everyone is so tied into this liberation narrative this idea of Hmm. freedom to do what you want that any ideas of constraint, especially from the elite, is just a non-starter for them. They don't want to be constrained. They don't want to be told, you can't do this. And largely, they're right in the sense that those people, more than anyone else in the population, is going to be able to successfully navigate these treacherous waters, whether it's dating, whether it's your personal finance, whether it's your social life. All of these things have become so unconstrained 
that a lot of people are falling through the cracks. A lot of people are kind of wandering around desperately to find some sort of way to navigate their life in, in a way that leads to stability or to, to you know, some sort of fulfilledness or at uh, least not just drop into disaster. So yeah, there's have a lot ever, of things. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the concept of the freedom of constraint? I mean, they don't frame it as such, but that's kind of my own little way of formulating it. Is the idea being when you have constraints and limits, there's a freedom to be found in it because you're, for example, constrained not to become an alcoholic or a drug addict because there are cultural yeah. forces, social forces preventing you from following through the cracks. That's its own type of freedom. Um, the freedom they're talking about is well, kind of utter chaos. And yes, I mean, it, it is the utter, it's, it's the limitless of options to where, as you said, the, the idea of constraints can help guide people. I mean, some some options in life lead to disaster, as I'm sure everyone here knows. Yeah. Um, some options lead to you ruining your life or ruining the lives of you and others or putting yourself in a position that is somewhat permanent or at least will have a lifelong uh, deleterious effect on you. So have, being able to prevent those through social stigma, social norms, maybe even the law, has always been pretty much common sense until yesterday. And so now, yeah, a lot of people are dealing with, um, I, I don't know what I would call today's relationship market. I, I, I don't know, uh, chaos, organized chaos. It, it just seems like people, no one really, ha yeah, nobody chaos. really has semi. Yeah, it's, it's not that great. And obviously people are trying to find some guidance, but this idea of constraint is just very, uh, very off-putting to the people who have power, to the people who could actually guide the culture for the rest of us. And I just don't see that happening. And this is where Rob Henderson's luxury beliefs come in, where these people are in the stratosphere of society where they have, they're very comfortable financially, they're very smart, they're usually very educated, they're usually very healthy, and they they are conscientious enough to be able to uh, experiment, test these ideas out, and do unconventional things, unorthodox things that uh, mainly wealth helps kind of help prevent them from falling into uh, False disarray. Cracks. Where yeah. that's right, and unfortunately, a lot of culture does come uh, has kind of a trickle down effect, and so you see normal average people or below average people trying to experiment with these things, and it just becomes a disaster because they're not able to actually deal with the uh, unorthodox nature of these things kind of like destiny right um mm. destiny's not a i don't want to defend destiny but he's not stupid he is no. wealthy and despite yes. uh his you know it's, he did to be fair to him he did say that my uh my dating life my my marriage uh is not a prototype is, is not for everybody yeah. yeah it's not for everybody I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, but for some reason he was the exception. But now we know that, like, clearly this was going to end badly, or it was very likely to end badly. Uh, yeah. And uh, no one should really be too surprised at at how this turned out, given the way women view relationships and their options now more than ever, and their yeah. freedom from constraint. So two, two points we see that everywhere now. Two points mm -hmm. he made here is his wife or ex-wife or whatever she is, soon to be. Melina, you know, a fairly attractive Swedish girl, still only 25, so fairly young, with lots of options. Although, from what I've seen, you know, again, I'm not much of a gossip monger. It's a strange choice she's made. But <laughs> it is. It but, is. Um, yeah, the good thing in Destiny's case is he's highly resilient. And by his own self description, he, yeah, he's he kind is. of sociopathic. I remember a couple of years ago uh, when yeah. the streamer Reckful took his own life, with whom he allegedly was good friends, and he's just sort of. It, it barely brushed him. It barely scratched him. It was it was okay. He was fine. I don't think he's going to be too affected one way or another. He'll be fine. I'm not too worried about Destiny. But I'm um, bringing up Rob Henderson again. I think it's important to bring up his background because uh, an orphan, a foster child, he never knew either of his parents. He took a DNA test. Apparently, he's like half Korean, half Mexican, or something like that. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Raised in foster care, he said, was it's literally the worst place. It's worse than single mothers. It's, you don't want to be raised in foster care. According to him, every person he went to school with, with the exception of himself, <laughs> fell through the cracks, didn't make it because yeah. of poor choices, poor whatever. He was blessed with a pretty prodigious mind, you know, good intellect. He finished uh, high school at age 17, joined the Air Force, got a full scholarship at Yale. Now he's a, 
uh, a regular kind of independent uh, sub stacker, got a lot of interesting ideas. But he acknowledges that he's the exception, not the rule. Because he's seen the reality on the ground of what happens. And the worst possible scenario is you don't have either a father or a mother and you're raised in an institution. And almost all of those people, as he describes, just they, they slipped through the cracks. A lot of them went to jail. A lot of them just a lot of them right. passed away. And yeah. um, he said publicly, it's, it's fascinating, you know, he would trade all his degrees, all his, his fame now is renown to have grown up in a, in, a, in a household with a mother and a father, which is a, a profound statement. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Um, you, you know, when you don't have something, you, it's very easy to, to recognize its, its absence, to, to acknowledge it. But the, the problem is he's the exception. He's made it into the, 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 the new elite circles. But, I can't imagine there being more than 100 people in U.S. history that have had that type of uh, life trajectory. Gone from just an orphanage to yeah. Ivy League, you know, just hit, no. hit the very top. So, yeah, his, his exposure and his unique life experience is very, very insightful, very unique. Insightful, and I think very helpful. Rare. I think if people cared, which they don't, you know, elites knew or otherwise, they would they would see counsel for them from him. He's got a biography coming out. They would They would talk to him. But <clears throat> I think another t- twist of this would be a, a lot of Americans. You see, anyone can do it. Rob Henderson pulled himself out of you know, an orphanage and foster oh, care. Rags to riches narrative. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, terrible. Like, all the while ignoring that he said well, something like 90% of everyone else just either uh, died or, or got arrested or something or just fell through the cracks. Right. Um, yeah. No, there's a serious issue of disconnect and, and disincentive. Um, yes. At some point in time, and I think has a, it's, it's, long, it's a long history, elites, new or otherwise, became much less interested in the, the, their servants, as it were, the people that were kind of economically, socioeconomically b- below them. The more I've thought about this particular issue, the more I think this is less of a recent thing and a kind of gradual uh, trajectory that we've gone uh, for a while. I agree. Going all the way back to feudalism, um, then we have the Black Death, and then eventually we kind of transition from feudalism to kind of mercantilism, all these things. All these steps and sort of economic structures eventually lead to a system where you know, subsistence farming isn't the main thing. So there's no relationship between you know, maybe a landowner and a, and a land worker. And eventually, you will get to where we are now, where Jeff Bezos doesn't know the, the names of anyone in his warehouse in Texas or anywhere else, for that matter. But yeah. it was a slow trickle down effect. I mean, so when Charles Murray was alive, that was still a thing, and that was sort of culturally enforced, right? But the more these sort of market forces were in operation, the more likely it was going to happen, and eventually, it just did. Now, almost no CEO knows who's working for them; they don't really care. There's no connection there. And people are just kind of, well, not just ants, but sort of ants uh, laboring for some force that they're not even aware of, and the force doesn't really care about them. And uh, it's right. it's a mess. But it started kind of a long time ago, and the only thing we had holding us together up until recently was, I would argue, religious institutions and and the culture that not only exclusively stand for that, but it's sort of. Traditions, you know, experiments that worked. Um, Say people, that in geographic constraint were, were big ones. Yes, where now, oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. Continue. Well, uh, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's funny that people talk about Chesterton's fence. Well, some people talk about Chesterton's fence a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if the audience is familiar. I, I'm not going to assume that it, the audience is, um, but Chesterton's fence. G.K. Chesterton was a famous Christian apologist. For the record, I don't think his apologetics were very convincing to my mind, but he did make the point, uh, the sort of allegory kind of, of, you know, if you're walking about in the woods and you encounter a fence uh, in, a, in an abandoned field, the smart thing to do is leave it intact because it might have served some kind of purpose. And he does this with respect to Christianity and I think religiosity more broadly. And there's something to be said for that, but I mean, we, we've just kind of rushed ahead you know, guns blazing as we always do as a species and sort of ignored a lot of these guardrails. And, you know, 
I don't even, at this stage, I'm not even sure if, if religious people are particularly hopeful. And I was listening to the distributist recently, and he kept on stressing the importance of, of the hereafter, as in you know, the afterlife, the, the life after this one purportedly. I'm thinking, you know, if Dave is, if Dave is talking about that, things must be really bad, you know? Yeah, and yeah. That's always been a fact, you know, a feature of Christianity. You know, this is a, this is just a momentary lapse, right? Until we are, our souls are ushered into eternity to be judged by God, but allegedly. But it it seems to me when you're really focusing on that, that's it's bad news because ultimately that's part of the origin of a lot of sort of organized religion. Life is harsh and, and terrible for the most part, and but you can look forward to a much better afterlife, right? And they're sort of right. re re regressing to that in religious circles. I've noticed not just Dave, but other people as well. And um, it's uh, it's a bit disconcerting. But yeah, connecting all these pieces is really difficult. And more importantly, the fundamental question is, is it even possible to reconnect these people? What does a, a new elite, I mean, even Dave, um, at times, the distributor says, made puzzling remarks that he to the fact that he can't understand why certain individuals you know, get lost in drugs or don't manage to secure uh, good relationships or jobs. And I'm not sure if he's just doing that sort of rhetorically or saying these things rhetorically. But the reality is, is that uh, he probably knows and you know, not everyone has his abilities and Therefore, he would probably acknowledge there's some kind of, you know, noblesse oblige, some kind of responsibility there. How how could that be enkindled or rekindled rather? Again, people have made suggestions like you know civil service where you travel across the country and work with other people from other socioeconomic strata. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, or mandatory military service before yeah, political office, things like that. But, Getting exposure to different classes before you take positions of authority could be helpful. I, that's um, certainly been my, I uh, I mean, I grew up middle class, but I've been exposed to the bottom rungs of society by dint of where I grew up, in the Bronx, New York. And I've also worked with the bottom rungs of society. I've also worked with really smart academic people and a couple of things in, in between. So... I do feel that that was pretty formative. I mean, for a lot of these people, this is an abstraction. But you know, have you ever dealt with really, really smart people that make you look like a, like a moron? Well, I have. Yes. And have you, yes. I've also dealt with people that are <laughs> that are all, all dumb as rocks, dumb as bricks, and everything in between. I think when it, that does give you a kind of perspective, because you need that perspective if you're going to think about the ramifications we're talking about, like you know the ripple effect and some kind of sense of guidance and, and, and what have you. As you said, the, the elites are much better equipped to navigate the treacherous waters of, uh, of late 2023 and, and going forward. And everyone else, not so much. It's, um, it's a mess. And yeah, that's the question that I think is the most relevant one. Can you create a, can you reconnect people? And I, my sense is, well, be a bit black belt here no it seems yeah. that the, the ties that bind have forever been severed um we see this everywhere i mean austin texas now has become sort of slowly mutating into the new san francisco the right. wealth the, the big shots are there you have chad williamson joe rogan uh lex friedman all these podcasting big shots tech people moving down there mm -hmm. and what's going to happen well Probably not any, not something identical because you still need to be in California for the you know that kind of chaos to, to break out. But you now, housing prices are going to go up. Uh, rent prices uh, are going homelessness up. and crime has gone yeah. up. You know, you are seeing huge oh, inequality okay. in the city okay. now, where oh, interesting. you know millionaires are trying to walk across the street as two bums fight each other. Um, yeah, it's it's, but that's to be expected in America these days. That that's not yeah. surprising at all. Well, sadly. That's the, yeah. Like, you know, I don't mean to, you know, it's just always sad to bring this up, but I remember the first time I showed you images of, of Europe. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, the, the one, here's one thing that I'll never forget, you know, I mean, in, in our many conversations, uh, and uh, it, it was a kind of watershed moment for myself, as it might have been for you. Um, I think I was explaining to you how I typically go shopping once a day because there are like five or six shop, uh, supermarkets within walking distance of me. And you, right. you, you, 
<laughs> you couldn't believe it. How is that even yeah, a thing? Yeah, no, no, it's a, a very alien to me. And just for context for the audience, uh, you had showed me photos of different cities around Europe, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. at first I thought they were AI-generated. I did not believe that <laughs> these things existed. Uh, you assured me, you know, you showed, showed proof. But uh, my, I was I was amazed because of how clean, how uh, kind of pro-social, if that makes sense. There's probably better descriptors for it, but people are out and about in their cafes. And um, maybe this is a product of me being in the Midwest, but it's very much the opposite here. It's a lot of driving. Um, yeah, there are some social events, but a lot more people are atomized. A lot more people aren't doing anything. There, this is in a walkable city, um, a term that's that's had a lot of uh, uh, exposure in the last few years where, you know, people are trying to create the 15 minute city, but in the United States, but I just don't think that's, that's feasible uh, given the way our city planning has been made. Well, given our reliance on vehicles and travel. Um, If I want to, you know, if you want to go to the store, it's what a 15 minute walk, maybe Uh, if I want to go to the store, it's nine miles, it's nine mile drive. Now, maybe, maybe some people look at that and think, yeah, you could walk that. I'm not going to walk nine miles, not in the place I live, which is not a walk, walk, walker friendly, pedestrian friendly for a variety of reasons. <laughs> you showed me uh, the image of that pitbull once that was uh, had a very yeah. strange look on his face, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> his, his head dangling over the fence. It, uh, I, I could see blood in his eyes, I think. Yeah, you're, you're dodging pit bulls, you're dodging homeless, you're, you're just a lot of chaos, a lot of dysfunction Yeah. Uh, in my area, so... The idea that we're going to create these type of areas or, or that these areas could even exist is very foreign for a lot of Americans. Um, we're very insulated yeah. in that way. Uh, maybe more worldly people, uh, have, well, I hope, would like to think, have seen the other side of the fence, which is greener in many ways. Um, but American cities <clears throat> are, are very much gutted out. They kind of have a donut effect where the downtown is 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 uh, very dysfunctional. Um the wealthy are living, you know, suburbs are continuing to grow. That's not going away despite urbanization because a lot of the wealthy will drive into the city where all the money is, but uh, no one really wants to live in the city. Yeah, there are exceptions like New York, but they are uh, major oh, exceptions. Uh, uh, yeah, Most people but, that have high levels of wealth are living in gated communities. Yeah, The American dream now is just to make enough money not to live in the city, but that that is where all the resources, <laughs> that's where all the talent yeah. is. And uh, this idea of, of American exceptionalism and the American dream um, has has very much eroded in the past several decades. But it's still kind of in the zeitgeist. There's still an era of positivity here for a lot of people or enough people that it, it kind of maintains itself. And I think people like Dave definitely see all of these things. Mm. And anyone who is paying attention may not say it out loud, but, uh, or maybe they will, like things are not going to get better for quite some time for society in general. Uh, we're yeah. still going through the, uh, the bottleneck, if you will. And, um, a lot of it is just the, it is the stratification. It is this, uh, insulation from people who are at the top, who I think many of them don't actually know how bad things are. I'm all, well, I'm certain of it. They, they just have no idea how bad things really are because they're living a great life. And if you make a lot of money in America, life can be good for you. But if you don't, it's kind of a meat grinder in in every way. So yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm very black pilled about this as well. And you know, there are things like religion can help, um, can help you spiritually and mentally, uh, socially. But as far as your, your economic financial situation is concerned i think dave even admitted this to you the last time you two spoke like he religious institutions don't have the ability to give you jobs they don't have the ability to to help you on that end and and it's a very huge factor that kind of uh touches everything else you know for yeah. better or for worse mainly for worse for a lot of people and i, I don't know what to do about that so lots to unpack i wish there. i had solutions but yeah the, yeah. the the sort of walk well, this started a century ago with automobiles and, and basically a kind yes. of automobile exactly. industrial complex that uh, was pushing people to give up because you know if you went by 120 years American cities were eminently walkable by design 
Um, right. That changed very rapidly, and now you end up with the monstrosity you have now. Europe I is, think um, it was certainly the deal was sealed once Eisenhower created the highway system. Where, yeah, yeah. you know, but yes, yes. So go, on, go on. Europe um, is not quite as bad as the United States, but it's a matter of time. Uh, many of the issues afflicting the United States are, you know, I, I, I always forget the exact uh, version of this phrase. You know, the U- U.S. sneezes and Europe catches a cold. Whatever. I mean, yeah. the sense of it is, is is conveyed regardless, and I think that. It's just a matter of time until the dysfunction we can observe in the United States uh, comes over to Europe. It'll be slower. It'll take a longer time. It'll take a maybe even a much longer time in some cases. Like, for example, our cities will remain, well, depending on which city, uh, decent looking and, and, and nice and generally speaking well kept compared to American cities. Huh. But, it is, yeah. but it is a matter of time. And... Yeah, I mean, to the point, people rarely seek to understand something if, they, if they're not afflicted by a particular issue. Um, this goes to the heart of what you're saying. You know, you're having a good time. You're a member of the elite class. I mean, you're either not aware or you don't care, or probably both to some degree, of what's happening to the classes beneath you. Right. And that makes sense. I mean... I think of most things, I mean, either people try to understand something because they find it fascinating, although the two are not exclusive, or they seek to understand something because they have a problem they wish to solve. But again, if they're not exclusive, they can be the one and the same. But I know, for example, my quest to sort of understand human biology, human sort of behavior, human nature, was born of the failures of my life. You could say the failures of my relationships, the many observations I made, and all the, the BS I was fed throughout my teens and my 20s about the nature of men and women and yeah and all this stuff it, it, it couldn't have been true it felt akin to someone just trying to convince me of the divine qualities of Jesus like this just there's no evidence for this um, and lo and behold I betook myself on the quest to understand this sort of stuff but I mean it was born of a problem that I was trying to solve mm-hmm. or you know, I have a fair knowledge on nutrition. Well, you know, I've off and on throughout my life, I've struggled with my weight. All these things are sort of problems that emerge. You need to understand them. You can't just attack them from any angle which, whatsoever. If you don't have many problems uh, or a particular set of problems, you're not going to be interested in solving them. So if you're highly functional, you know, you, you got a nice brother, your parents are great, you're, they're sending you to a private school, they, what's the incentive? Now, admittedly, there's some people that kind of probably care in the abstract, but you look at the rare examples of people who I think kind of sort of care, and you get like a Rob Henderson, um, who literally came from the trenches, you know, the trenches of, right. of, of L.A., one of the biggest shitholes in the United States. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, it, so he made it, so what? I mean, he, he's the exception, not the rule, and... Is he going to convince his fellow? Well, not really. In fact, most of his fellow leads, the guy he talks to Chad Williamson regularly, don't. They have no idea, and they're not really interested in in that aspect of things. They're interested in his theories, but they're not interested it's in all ab- It's all abstract. I mean, yeah, I, I, lo- I would love to see anyone who makes, who's in the 1%, like, go, go, and go and work at a food kitchen for one day, and I think they would just be horrified and shock and probably just complete disbelief at how how different people are how those yeah. without those talents or without those abilities without that stability without the proper child rearing uh who, who were not given a very good hand at life in every way live it it is it is it is completely uh Un- unknown to these people and unfortunately there's no incentive for most of them to care as you said one, because it's not in their in their uh, day to day life, or in their purview, or in in their periphery, and how and, ha- and where they live, and how they live. Um, and until that starts really leaking into those who can do things about this, I don't see much change happening, unfortunately. But that might not ever happen. Uh, Stardust, I, I mean, these people really do have enough wealth to insulate themselves. There's enough qualified people to keep their ways of living somewhat maintained and yeah if you're not part of that group you're struggling really hard at least in the united states so 
for the foreseeable future, things are going to get uh, quantitatively worse. Yeah, um, and I, I, I feel I very much feel bad for a lot of people out there because yeah, yeah, it's tough. It's what I would refer to as a kind of I call it sort of a sociobiological speciation event. Hundred uh, percent. People, people always struggle with things they're not familiar with. I've talked about this multiple times. You know, I don't know if I've coined the term, but I think I have the problem of self extrapolation. I like to think I have. Yeah. And, um, can I mean? It's very hard um, if you don't have a, a certain type of mindset or a certain type of uh, architecture and uh, mental architecture to understand, even consider what someone else is is do, is going through. You know, the the average person says, "Well, I'm not familiar with this, so I just I have no idea. I don't I don't get it. Uh, whatever." Um, and when they do get something, you know, they they might feel like they can relate, but. This is fundamentally the problem um, that that the, these people are not incentivized, but they're not also not exposed to it. There's a I think Andrew Yang kind of cares, but he again another guy I think he sent his, his kid has autism or something is in a public school. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it really does seem like the people that have somehow been touched by <laughs> the dregs of society, as it were, a little more than others, actually start. Sure start caring. I mean, almost every person I'm close to that I care about a lot, you included, obviously, as you know, is, is struggling deeply. And it, yeah, you know, I'm struggling too, obviously, to varying degrees. It's just, that's why I have, I'm sort of, I, I think about this stuff. Sure. Is it interesting? Of course. But I think you know, I think it's it's the sort of the problem itself that sort of begets the interest, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what people could do to get. We just keep on coming back to this problem. Get the people who could actually do something, whether it comes to policy or what have you, to to, to intervene and actually care. As you pointed out, right? They're but too well the, insulated. The, yeah, the glaring problem is how do you. How, how do you get the power to make them do that? And you can't. So it kind of has to, I, I guess societal dysfunction has to get large enough for them to feel it, which is really sad because that means a lot of people are going to suffer <laughs> um, in order for that to even happen. And that's, it's not even guaranteed that it will, you know, uh, we've yeah. talked about this before with capital flight and just the ability, yeah. the, the mobility of our uh, elite class is, is substantial. Yeah. It's global in fact. So, Peter Thiel's you know, mansion in the South Island of New Zealand. Yes, Peter yeah, Thiel's yeah, mansion yeah, yeah. in the South Island. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they're making doomsday bunkers. That's that's what I want to see from people <laughs> making decisions. Feel feel pretty good yeah. about that. Allegedly drinking the blood, uh, not literally, of, of the youth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I hate to bring up that film Elysium, but I always do. It's not a good film, but at least the concept kind of makes sense. But it does feel like yeah. we're, we're, we're either there or we're certainly heading in that direction, at least the sort of uh, prototypical or the, the initial stages of it. And, you know, it, it, I can observe this firsthand. One of my closest friends, linguistic genius, I mean, he's not well off, but he's doing quite well all things because he doesn't really have any real problems, uh, to, so to speak, uh, to speak of. Uh-huh. So all, he just, he's totally oblivious to all of this stuff. Um, I remember telling him about sort of relationship dynamics in the, in the current uh, the current year, as it were, and he's happily married. You know, sometimes you can tell. I just don't think that marriage is going to dissolve, and um, he just doesn't know about this stuff. And you know, good for him. You know, he doesn't have to deal with it. But so right. I was thinking of the perfect example of sort of a kind of ignorance being blessed. Sometimes ignorance is terrible. Actually, sometimes it's very harmful. But there's a kind of ignorance that's, that's bliss if you're not affected by things. And I, 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 we just keep on coming back to that. There is enough entertainment right now to yeah. fill castles, I don't know. But the problem here, and what I've learned over the years is, that's all hollow. If you don't have people in your life that that can that you care about and vice versa that motivate you. I mean, humans are, are social creatures, animals. Then there's only so much you can do with the extracurricular stuff. 
and seemingly um, meaningful human experiences and relationships are less and less accessible. And we even see this, I mean, I hate to bring up Destiny again, but he's an interesting example because... I mean, he, by his own admission, he's somewhat sociopathic, so maybe it's not a much of a concern. But I, I, he doesn't strike me as a person who has sort of deep, uh, close relationships with his fellow human beings. I mean, he knows a lot of people, no, no doubt about that. But you know, I, you know how, how 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 deep does it go? Seems pretty surface level to me. But he's sort of the embodiment of so many of these things, right? He's super successful. He's wealthy. All these things. But how much substance does he actually have in his life? I mean, is the substance of his life, you know, being a debate bro and 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 winning brownie points online with people that he argues against? I would say it's, yes, yes, it is. That and is maybe the substance of his life, and if, and he he claims he loves it, so can't yeah, be that and maybe bad. that's enough. But maybe it, for it him that's enough. It's, it's yeah. negatives. And maybe for him that's enough, but. Um, and I know a couple people whose sort of occupation really is their life fulfillment, but I think for most people the occupation Very is rare. Sec- yeah, it's secondary. Like there are pe- people who do things they don't mind. Um, you're now a officially a green thumb, I think, right? Would safe to say? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm and, in the agriculture uh, uh-huh, industry, and, and you being a green thumb, I know you you like it more than the work you used to do. Yeah, but I enjoy it, it a lot. I, I find mm-hmm. it. I find some passion in it. Um, I enjoy becoming kind of a master at my craft. Mm-hmm. Um, I've really taken to learning and researching and, and a lot of hands-on building because I want to be the best at what I can do, um, which is a nice thing to find. A lot of people mm-hmm. don't even have that, where they're just yeah. kind of a wagey, doing it because yeah. they have to survive. Um, I knew what that felt like for 30 out of 32, or I guess most of my working life, I'll say. Yeah. Um, but even then, I'm not completely obsessed, right? No, I'm no. not. Uh, I'm not ignoring every other aspect of my life because I just can't stop doing what I love, and this is the best <laughs> thing ever, and I must do it. Yeah. But uh, very few people can do that, and sometimes they're very brilliant. I mean, a lot of. I would. Would you say a lot of human development and human innovation has probably come from people like that? But uh, it's very rare, and it's not something I would ever advise. Which I know you're not a big fan of that either, but. To saying like go do something that you love and that's enough is just simply not true for anyone I know. Well, most I'm people sure. don't love people anything. Listening. That's the problem. Yeah. Right? In terms yeah, of activity, yeah, yeah. I have many interests. Um, well, many, a few. Um, but there, there are points where uh, you know I'm out of my depth. Not just because I don't have the knowledge. I just, there's a level of interest I had that's kind of that gets arrested at some point in time. Like with my sure. linguist friend, like the the greatest linguist who ever lived potentially. <laughs> Well, maybe Indeed. not that, but just at least currently. <laughs> he's pretty great. I mean, I have an interest in that stuff, but not at his level. I mean, he's like, he's so, so yeah, if, if find something you love. Most people just don't love a thing. They, they, they like certain things and certain activities they find, uh, you know, swell or what have you, but that's just not the reality. Most people find uh, much more fulfillment in, in their friendships and their community if they have one and things of that nature. Uh, and, and, you know, if they're very fortunate, you know, maybe they have a healthy relationship with their family. Which is well, hard to come by. And yeah, if you ever had it at all, um, if you ever, yeah, of developing your own. Yeah, I mean it. It's it's all relative. Obviously, I'm I know I'm, I have the best relationship with my parents. Uh, glad I didn't grow up as a foster child, uh, but it could have been better. I mean, everything could be. Sure. But uh, I think that. Someone's going to have to figure out something, frankly, or this is just going to get worse and worse. It's, well, you know, the yeah, the only well, thing I, I, I've said before, you know, that uh, that I've told you in your darkest moments, for both forthrightly without, you know, bullshitting you, and I think you, you acknowledge that, is go find a better place where you can be okay with people that you might be okay with. I mean... But that for a lot of people, not even that's feasible, you know. And you're still, you know, you're still in a place of struggle. Up, we we all are, right? Right. So, right. It's just, it's kind of it, this is what it's become. It's sort of every man for himself. Go find some place, some anywhere, like go find a place where there, there isn't a menacing pit bull ready to you know bite your jugular out, <laughs> right? 
Like that is, <laughs> that's a start, right? I don't, I don't want to be too demanding, but yeah, that would be nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Where, where, you know, hood rats aren't going to, you know, carjack you or rob you or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, what, what else can, can you do these days? Pe- people escape to the places they can look. I'm, I'm eternally grateful that I, uh, that I, I've had a European father. I've had my issues with my father throughout my life, but you know, I lucked out sure. in that respect because I was able to escape many, many moons ago, and my life has been better for. It's not perfect by any means, but if I had stayed in uh, New York City, as I like to refer to it sometimes, uh, the hellscape of New York City, I, I don't know. Yeah. Might have been homeless. I, I I don't know if I. I think the city would have devoured me, eaten me up, and and chewed me up and, and spit me out. As it, it does with many, you know. Oh, yeah, who I mean, are in... New York City is really <laughs> you know, only the the cream of the crop actually are having a good time with with rent prices that are you, know, you couldn't even fathom half the time. Uh, there's a uh, New York City is a weird place because it's kind of got its own culture of a sort of uh, local delusion. Like it's such a there. There are normal people, average people, normies who delude themselves and thinking that New York City is just such a such an incredible place that you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I remember listening to people for all my life talk about that, and I I just thought that can, what is the basis of that judgment? Where what are you comparing here? It's it's insane. Just because it's New York City, which is obviously has a little, it's the biggest city in the United States, but. Most people are struggling there. Uh, they're commuting. They're riding the subway. Their eyes glued to the, to the floor so the crazy people don't assault them. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's not that great. I mean, there's no major American city that's great. that doesn't exist anymore, at least. So you're right. I would Everyone say Detroit wants to might be pretty good. Yeah, um, Detroit's a great, it's a great place. Booming audio <laughs> industry. Uh, it's great. Safe. And, hey, what, what I recently discovered... Um, and I admit I was unaware of this. D- Detroit uh, style pizza. I was unaware of this. Um, oh. It is it is a thing apparently. But uh, yeah, Detroit's a great place. Uh, definitely a place people can go to. Now the, the U.S. is uh, flee to a suburb. Wow, that's your solution. And and, and yeah. But even you know, and I mean, I, even, I, even those are getting shut off with housing prices. I, again, a lot of yeah. this is economic. Yeah, um, I, I, I've paid attention a lot to the, like the rural, urban, suburban uh, discussions, and and uh, it's a real mixed bag. I see both sides. Like I've I've listened to New Yorkers, like you described, talk about how it's the best in the world, uh, and in uh, many ways, I mean, whether it's cuisine or there is some culture that's being produced. Um, again, if you have money, like there's a lot that you can do there. There's a lot of entertainment. There's a lot of if you have money, uh, different. If you yeah. yeah that huge huge asterisk on that on that on that uh, comment, but uh, if you're not, you are struggling. Unfortunately, a lot of people still find a lot of pull to the cities because it's where the opportunities are. Now the trade offs are immense and and greater by the day, um, but a lot of people from the cities will look at rural America and say like, well, these are dying, these are dysfunctional, these are. Uh, a lot of them are brain drained. A lot of them are stagnant. A lot of them are are very old. I mean, there's no the dating market is gone, and they're right. They're right. And uh, the conclusion I come to is everywhere is kind of shit. So, <laughs> at that, least in the United States, there's pockets. Accurate. But if you want to if you want to enter those areas, you better be making some serious money, and you better check off a lot of other boxes on the list. The, yeah, you better there's... be pretty social. Uh, you better be fairly smart because you got to maintain it too, right? Um, you you want to live there, you want to have that lifestyle. Of, like there's 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 a lot of gatekeeping, both intentional and just uh, by the very nature of how uh, society operates. So very tough, very tough bet for a lot of people, and a lot of people will not have access to it. Yeah. The bad news I've noticed. I've seen some reports of uh, so the Pacific Northwest, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho. There seems to be an exodus of, again from you know, wealthy coastal oh, yes. from from California and, and elsewhere you know, moving these places, jacking up the, the local prices and especially rent. Yeah, and, Texas, um, Florida, also. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, 
those make more sense. Like, where do you, but most people are like, oh, I really want to live in the middle of Montana, but no, that's happening too. And there's space there. Can you afford it? Well, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's it is cheaper. It is, cheaper, it is, che- but, it is uh, cheaper, but with, there are actual coastal, kind of helps with that, but yeah. Oh yeah. They're coastal leads who do just that remote work. And so they can afford it and they want to live in this you know, idyllic, nice place. Um, and yeah, they're kind of ruining it for normal folk. And yes. Yeah. I, I don't, one thing that always has baffled me is this, this delusion that Mary, many Americans labor under that it's just this great, great place. Some of it's predicated on the so-called American dream, whatever that means. I don't, I'm not really sure anymore, I guess. Other, it's sort of, the, it's just this, this, I don't really, like, I can imagine why a wealthy person who sees a lot of business opportunities in the United States uh, thinks it's great. I mean, Chad Williamson emigrated to the United States from the UK because he is one of those types of people. Yeah, he um, could he could definitely... Uh take advantage of those opportunities, but yeah, obviously yeah. not many people are Chad Williamson, no. um, have the networking ability. I would say it's also very good for the very, very bottom of the world. If you're living in yeah, a, yeah. a favela, mm-hmm. this is more enticing. Um, yeah. but if you're kind of in the, I don't know, 20 to 80% of any population, like, yeah, this is, this is going to be tough. You're going to struggle. And uh, I would be one of those people where the hamster wheel is just moving faster and faster and you're just trying to stay on for the ride. But as far as uh, making big moves, you know, there's some opportunities available, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, pitfalls. There's a lot of roadblocks and time's a ticking. Uh, uh, these opportunities are becoming more and more scarce. So I'm rooting for you, as you know. Thanks, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we'll try. We'll see what happens. Well, to uh, to <laughs> Never give up. Wow. Well, yeah. To quote that guy, that uh, sad story I, I just covered in the recent video. Yeah, it's sort of, I mean, this kind of ties into some of what we've been talking about. So like the value of delusion, right? Like, I, I don't know if you watched right. my most recent video, but there's the Swedish guy who uh, yeah, allegedly had some spiritual bond with his new wife who then just flew back to Argentina and says she's going to stay there for the next two years. And he say, well, I'm going to prepare right. and... Uh, get ready and this and that. I mean, yeah. I a wonder if some of delusion does help and yeah. to get you there. If you, I think if you have just a very cold objective, look at everything, uh, motivation can really run out quickly. Um, mm-hmm. finding direction, uh, creating, yeah. you know, sustainable goals can be very difficult because if you look if a proper look at the landscape, kind of tells you that probabilistically things things will not turn out well. So you got to have a little bit of, well, you have to have a lot of luck. We you've talked about that a lot. Yeah. And you you kind of need to have a little delusion to kind of push you there. Um yeah. So yeah, but but even then, you know, you might not make it, which might just be the tragedy of life, but there is a very unique narrative or delusion in America about how good, quote unquote, good things are. And how we're all kind of just temporarily embarrassed millionaires. <laughs> um, yeah. That's a good one. I never heard that one. Temporary. I'm yeah. going to borrow and attribute to you and temporarily embarrassed. Yeah, me. yeah. We're all we're we're all about to make it any day now. So <laughs> I, I I can see myself dining with Bezos and Musk in a few months. Just need to make some moves, get my hustle and grind on, and things will be fine. Yeah. I remember um, years ago, apropos, some guy calling into some radio show in Texas and. You know, proud American, and it was like, "Hey, Larry, how's it going?" And I'm just calling him briefly. I'm, I'm, go, I'm, go, I'm on my way to my fourth job. My man, praise God! And you know, it was a wow. Yep. You know, but here's a hot take. Uh, for well, we weren't kind of uh, designed to be that way, but I think you and I could have profited from some delusion. I feel like we are poster children for how <laughs> bad it can get when you strip away every possible delusion you've had oh, about. Yeah human existence it's like because then you're no longer if you're rigorously honest at least as i tend to be with you Mm -hmm. there's no i can't bs you you know i i'm I'm like yeah i'm sure it's gonna get better i'll say well if you do x there's some probability that maybe you know (laughs) it's just it, it it seems 
uh, too many people I know is you strip away every delusion or illusion and then there's just nothing left, you know. You've, you've, I mean, you've suffered more than I have in a variety of ways. One of them, you know, you, you were uh, de-Christianized, you know. Yeah, yeah, I did lose my faith. Yeah, that was tough. And, yeah, I've never believed in anything uh, remotely divine, so <laughs> that never, you know, that, though I, I can, I, I still pined away for it. I pined for it. I mean, how great would that be? Which is why I'm just deeply skeptical about Dave and his sort of, it's just the things he says he really believe, or well, maybe. But, um, but yeah, one, you strip away one, and then you just, what's left? And I think this is a lot of the, the, the pushback I'll get from sort of normies or what have you is that they really want to be lied to. Uh, I don't mean in a bad way, like, like oh, they're bad people. So, no, I mean, they want to be lied to because that is what's going to give them comfort and that's going to kind of work for them. People don't want to understand. I was arguing earlier today with some woman. She said, we're not animals. I said, we are. Uh, and Wrong here's person the to say that to. <laughs> yeah. Or apes. I said, we're apes. I said, no. no well, you might be an ape, but I ain't no ape. Okay. Um, Checkmate. <laughs> Checkmate, yeah. I uh, mean that that theory of evolution ain't that, uh, but um, well, this yeah, goes I, back to traditions where, like, yeah, I mean, there yeah. there needed to be kind of a narrative drawn, a a story told. We're very big on stories, as yeah. you know. They have to be connected. We, we'd like, yeah, we, the stories we like have to, to hear about to something meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, uh, you need to have some sort of archetype to look up to, or to have people who can give you the wisdom to help move you forward. And when all of that's gone, uh, things can look very bleak. And when things are bleak and there's not a way out, a lot of people will opt out or uh, check out in other more severe ways, which we see a lot of. Yeah, this I is... don't really know what to do about this, Stardust, because, I mean, uh, if, if anything, like, the Internet really has kind of pulled the curtain down on a lot of things, exposed a lot of things. Yeah. Um, when it comes to delusion, you know, people lived in kind of a more localized world where... Uh, what you had around you was, you know, for better or for worse, it was good enough because that's all you knew. And uh, I find that likely would have been very, uh, very comforting. safe for mentally healthy, comforting. Yes, comforting. Yeah, Where yeah. now you see the entire world and you're just like, oh my gosh, very daunting. And it's really hard to look away, so to speak. Uh, we've we've been staring into the abyss for a while. It's been staring back too. So yeah, I'm the first one to admit. You know, I'm not going to lie. Stripping away all these layers of uh, lies, delusion, illusion, stories has not made me happier, I think. Uh, I'm not a more content <laughs> individual uh, for it. And uh, I will admit, acknowledge that. Now, do I still think that it's you know, true? Well, yes, but uh, you know, utility versus truth is one of those big discussions. Um, sure. You know, I know you've read Plato before. It's been a while since I've read Plato. What? I think Plato, when he talks about sort of religion, he has, I forgot the exact description he uses, this idea that you have these stewards that sort of guide the religion that don't actually believe, and then you have the people who do believe. There's also a Roman philosopher, was it Seneca? It's one of, it's one of either the younger, or, the, or maybe it was Pliny, I don't know. Mm, what, is, what, is, what did he say? He said, uh, the... Uh, the, the common man believe the gods to be true. Uh, the philosophers believe the gods to be false, and the rulers believe them to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, uh, maybe that's, that's cynical. What we, that's pretty cynical, but I, it's hard to dispute. Uh, yeah. um, you know, I don't want to try to offend anyone here, but like a lot of these are social technologies that help kind of control the populations, you know, the opium of the masses, so on and so forth. Um, but, yeah, I, I would imagine people at the very top are very calculative, very cold, don't really believe in a lot of things other than their own talent and utility. Um, in the world we live in now, most people just don't have the luxury of, of living off those talents. They, they need people. Like I, It really does come back to people like more than anything else and, and, a, and a, I guess, a healthy social life with other people. Because what, what else what else does really matter? Everything else is kind of secondary. 
Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, you need these stories for the, you know, on the macro scale and for the long game, but uh, very few people are going to be content or satisfied uh, with no one. I mean, I see a lot of pushback on this all the time where even I like, like uh, having some of my own solitude. I don't like dealing with stupid people all day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would, I w- it's much better to have people close to you in your life than no one at all. And I, I feel like right. we're really doubling down on that as a way to cope with the growing atomization. Um, and to kind of tie it back into the, you know, the effect that elites have and the authority they have there, there's really no incentive. There's no attempt to kind of reestablish a collective vision of anything to help the common man. So yeah, we are kind of left in a free for all while everything else continues to grow and dysfunction. And, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, and then not, you have not people, a good, not a good place. I mean, Chad Williamson, I, admittedly i hate watch a bit but i mean he also is the only guy that regularly has sort of evolutionary psychologists on so i think yeah it's it's something but you know, i he'll dream say of things a day like, where you'll have him on here by the way i yeah. would love to see that so. he wouldn't profit from it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it infamously he said in some interview he was put on the spot you know he said what are you optimizing for chris he said I'm optimizing for peace in my life. And then I could only see his half oh naked body on, on, on his Twitter and talking about how it's like, you could be a yogi in India or a Tibetan monk. And then I would believe you, but I think we all know what you're optimizing for, but no, he's, yeah, yeah. He was totally thrown off by that question. Obviously oh, he, he, yeah, he, he plays it very safe, <laughs> obviously very, very safe. Uh, but you know, he's all about, he's all performative and, and what have you, but yeah. he's, he, his, his war on cynicism, you know, cynics, uh, I don't want to hear about the, the, I mean, he's a perfect example of a kind of an elite that, that just doesn't care. He had Robert Sapolsky on, barely touched upon free will, because he's yep. preaching his message of agency. Um, okay. You know, I, I yeah, so I, I, I just, yeah, we just come back to the same spot, unfortunately, where the elites don't really care, and all I can say is you people need to go someplace where they can find people they can get along that where where it's not dangerous, not crime ridden, where they can live out their lives. Um, with respect to relationships, I don't know. You know, I'm still rooting. I'm still rooting for you. You know, you move out to Montana and you'll. Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> you'll meet uh we'll what, we'll amy amy in the dairy fields with her her blonde yeah. pigtails and uh yeah but um i'm gonna be walking through a wheat field one day <laughs> and there she'll be so yeah yeah but <laughs> it's just that that's kind of the only solution i have and it's not really much of a solution like flee flee the shithole you live in right now find a place not as bad and and maybe you'll you know find people you can get along with or at least you know but i I've discovered this. I mean, I would be, my life would be nothing without my friends. Now, people might consider it a weakness, but what's the point, really? Uh, you know, the the stuff on the side, the extracurricular stuff is nice, but it's only nice when you have a solid core. In an earlier yeah. iteration of, of human existence, you know, having a family and what have you was, was the core, but you know, I don't really have much of a family. And, you know, that's just, that, that ship has sailed, obviously for most of us. Um, yeah. So you have to make do with what you, what you do have access to and what you, what you can get. And that's kind of the solution. Kind of every man for himself in an effort to just find some place that isn't quite as bad as where he is now. Hope find a bunch of people that he can connect with or, or whatever. I mean, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the internet. That's how we met. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, you are... You're like the brother I've never had, as I've said many times. But yeah, same. You know, it would be a lot better if you were, you know, right around the block, and we could, uh, you know, both get back into shape together or whatever. But those are the things ultimately that matter. It's like I just, it's just so, and and that's really what's been hollowed out and what people people lack uh, increasingly, because I think the only worse thing than not having, you know, those types of important relationships is having those relationships when they're, for lack of a better word, I hate this word, toxic and, and destructive. Right. right. And then yeah, in which case no, you, you have to f- flee that. It's just, um, speaking, I'd love to get Rob Henderson on. I, I don't, he might even, he might agree to get along with me. Maybe. 
It's I mean, I had. He's he's on friendly terms with the chatistician, and I've talked okay. to the chatistician before, so could be because I, I, I'm just so. I think he would be much more willing to answer hard questions. He wouldn't artfully dodge them like, uh, say, Chad Williamson typically does, and just stay. Had a lot of great guests over the years. Uh, yeah. You were able to get Rob on. You would be able to tap into a life story and yeah. life experience that are, is so rare and, and desperately needed. Yeah, I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm seriously considering it. Uh, I want to first um, contact him on Twitter, give him the breakdown. You know, I'm not a famous guy, but because I think there, there will be a lot of coinciding there uh, to, to some degree. Because I... Most of the interviews I see with him, they don't really go into the details. Like I want to know the visceral stuff. Of what what's that like, growing up in foster care and in, in 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 L.A. of all places, and you know, how you sort of climbed out of that abyss, that pit, and just sort of the ramifications of that, and what people just don't get because they usually go, oh, "What are luxury beliefs?" And yeah, we get that, but his book is coming out, and and I, I probably gonna be one of the few books that I read in the not too distant future, but. Yeah, I want to. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd like to get someone on like that, um, but because I, I, if I don't, I don't, I don't. I mean, maybe I'm not smart enough. I don't have any ideas other than you need to get out and just try to find some place that isn't quite as bad as it is now. And and I don't. Maybe he has some ideas, but I have this sneaking suspicion that even a guy as smart as he is is just going to be well. We can just observe and you know analyze and. I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but if he's being honest, he, he's probably going to say something similar to us. Um, but he, he's also been through trials and tribulations that uh, I can't imagine. I yeah. mean, the foster system really is, at least in the United States, really is as bad as people think. Um, yeah. And if you don't get plucked by a family when you're an infant or a small child or toddler, uh, the longer you're in the system the more likely your life is going to be really bad um, in terms of like life outcomes. This is, this is measurable. This has been observed. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, my, you know, again, it's anecdotal, but my mother, uh, when she was growing up, their parents, they adopted someone, um, and they adopted him late, I think around 12 or 13. And he was so dysfunctional, kind of violent, mm-hmm. uh, misbehaved that they uh they sent him back which is that's a uh, real i don't, i know yeah. that's you know what it reminds I, me I, of? I sympathize with all parties but uh my mom got in touch with him like 30 years later and his life is really bad really tough uh living in living in the system um very poor uh you know nobody nobody around for him so yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's a real thing i would love to hear if rob had any insights on that because i think it parallels with a lot of other tough upbringings i mean the foster system might be the worst i mean short of like you know sexual abuse or something that, mm. like that growing up but living in a broken home is slowly becoming the norm mm. the two-parent privilege seems to be kind of a thing as time goes on and yeah these developmental years are pretty serious um in couple terms of, of yeah a couple of points here uh one you we can't discount the genetic factors i mean the fact that when you have orphans, they're usually born to parents that can't take care of them. It's probably have certain attributes, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So they're already they, you know, as I you know, as I like to say, uh, you know, it's, it's not how you deal with the hand; you are the hand, right? So they're they're right. they are that right. hand. And um, it's unfortunate. I've seen some data to suggest that by really by the time you finish finish elementary school, frequently that your life trajectory is pretty much decided, as in the things you're gonna. You know, you're, whether you're going to do well or not, or not, or or make it even, yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal, and we're not honest about that. I mean, this is another you know pet peeve of mine, where I think that honesty would be better than the fairy tale. I think we're actually hurting people, making it seem because everyone. So here's the thing, especially for say, younger people, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Go ahead. We all say life is unfair, right? Oh, life is unfair. Mm, okay. But people don't act as if life is unfair. When they criticize no, people they for not making it, like the 90% of people that I think that, that there was the number he used, might be even more, that didn't make it out, out of foster care, that, that died, fell through the cracks. Um, well, they should have gra- you know, grabbed those bootstraps and uh, yeah, hit yeah. the pavement and 
worked hard. Yeah, I mean, what's the, the problem? Pound the. My father used to use that expression. I know. I know. Pavement. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, I, when I was your age, I was pounding the pavement. Like, yeah, that's you. You you don't do that. I mean, I during the Great Recession uh, in two thousand eight, you know, I had to temporarily move back in with my parents, and it was a nightmare yeah. for a variety of reasons. But at the time, you were sending out applications already online, and uh, anyway, but yeah, the fact that so much is decided for you the moment you're born is later on. You know, by the time you're halfway through done done with elementary school is uh pretty depressing and it's interesting there are some kind of left wing there's this woman Paige Harden who I'm not really fond of but, be, but she is a left wing geneticist behavioral geneticist and she talks mm-hmm. about this you know the kind of early childhood interventions that you need to um, need to apply in order to make sure people don't fall through the cracks not even to enhance people just make sure that you know, Jimmy can read a book properly or whatever it might right. be. And there's a lot to be said for that, but to an extent. We, yeah, to an extent, yeah. But the fact of the matter is we don't actually act as if life is unfair. We say it all the time. It's the fundamental issue that fa- faces all of us. We don't act it because we 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 just assume like, you, you know me, I'm I'm kind of exactly to a point. Like I would never say somebody deserves something that just because it makes no sense in my worldview. But you know, I'll see like uh, more plates, more dates. This famous guy talks about steroids on Joe Rogan. Oh, you deserve it, like, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't like just... the idea. The whole "you get what you deserve" thing. I mean, there might be a little bit of room in where like. You, you were given good advice that you didn't take, but it, even that I find questionable. Really, there's not a lot of room for it at all. But people normally just look at people in bad situations and and kind of just berate them, or just kind of a Schadenfreude type of situation happening where they're like, "Yeah, yeah. that's that's what you deserve. That's you belong there." You know, as they walk past the mentally ill homeless man who's been walking the streets for thirty years, or Stuff like that. Now, there are examples of people doing the right thing where they fail or things don't work out. I mean, there's I have sympathy for that as well. But this idea that you're self-made or that you can kind of plow the path forward is just really a uh, illusion, in my opinion. Um, yeah. To say nothing about the genetic cards you're dealt and what your capabilities are in a very increasingly competitive world. Um, that's not having a lot of sympathy for those who don't make it so, or those who struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No man is an island, I mean, but oftentimes, like Chris Bum said, the uh, five-time classic uh, Olympia winner, he's talk- he went on Chad Williams and talked about the network he has. You know, he has his wife that, who's now been inseminated by him, so Chad baby along the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, his, his brother-in-law who helps him with stuff, his friend who helps manage his business, all these things. This is not a self-made man, you know. Oh, you know, you work so hard at this. Yeah, but he would be, he would literally would be maybe almost nowhere without all these people in his life, which he admits. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, I, I really dislike the self made narrative. I think the concept of dessert is, is more destructive than it is beneficial. Yes. Uh, it, it reinforces us versus them. And all these people that are, you know, quick to point out the, the mentally ill homeless guy, I mean, if you were that guy, if you were the that a person with the same genes and environment, you would be him. Right. Right. I try to explain it in terms of like if you were to reset this guy's life and uh, made a few alterations, I, it's likely that he would end up in a similar place just because, uh, I mean, that's that's kind of the world we live in in the end. And, he, you know, he's going to be guided by his own his own abilities and limitations, uh, which are probably going to lead him downward uh, as far as uh, social mobility is concerned. So uh, like just like the Olympic individual. Yeah, he had a big network of, of people, but he also had great genes. Oh, yeah, um, amazing. You know, amazing like his, physique, his base, like his. Yeah, that's right. I mean, his foundation was already incredible. So it, it, it's 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 like you've said before. And many of others have said it's easy to tear down people's abilities and, and what they have. It's kind of impossible to build it beyond what they're capable of. And that is a belief and understanding that a lot of people do not want to accept because it kind of blows the narrative and the, uh, 
uh, perceptions we have broadly out of the water where if you work hard, you can get this and, and achieve this and earn this and um, wow. that that you're the product of your own efforts um, in, in a way that, that that is intentional and deliberate and uh, yeah. consciously made. Uh, th- these are things that people really hold on to because there, there's a feeling of achievement that comes with that that I guess can be positive. Um, you know, yeah. like I, I'm I'm. I'm trying, you know, I, I feel senses of senses of achievement, moments of achievement where that feel good. But inevitably, uh, I, I know that this is just kind of a built in process where I don't really have a lot of agency to do it. And to the wealthy and successful, they don't want to hear otherwise, in my opinion. I need to steel man that position. I mean, I, I sure. never fear any feel any sense of pride or satisfaction with anything I do, because ultimately I'm not the steering wheel. I, I I mean, right. not that I produce anything of merit, but if I were to, um, I wouldn't. And even in the few instances where I think, oh, this isn't too bad. Um, so it's true. But I'd, I would just have to sort of bring up Robert Sapolsky's point because all the sort right. of the super elites who say, oh, well, what about dessert and merit? And you know, people, feel, as, as Sapolsky said, most people suffering in the world are not suffering because they're not getting their special award. They're they're being you know blamed for things yep. that they didn't really they they couldn't change about themselves, and right. you know we also there's a fascinating thing I've observed with people and that's sort of um you, you know you know the the attribution fallacy right I mean for example um, yes yes like we'll, we'll we'll look at people we're only looking at this end product. I know people look at me, I get this all the time, like, oh, why are you so depressed? Like, well, you're getting this end product. And so I've been told by, by people, know it all, like, you see a therapist, do this. Like, well, actually, main, one of the main, re- major reasons for my depression is I've been chronically sleep deprived for over three decades. Oh, that kind of makes sense. And then yeah, they, then they yeah. try to prescribe... <laughs> You know, like a gazillion different. Have you tried this? Like, yes, I've tried. You know, all, which it's all because arguably well intentioned. The point is, is that you look at a final product of a person, you're not thinking about all, all the stuff that went into him. Like, you know, er, I, I I regret things, uh, despite my belief in determinism, and you know what what could have what could have been had I not been the sleep deprived individual that I am. How much better a human being achieve things I wanted to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm cause I've, I've been laboring for, for decades now under a permanent handicap. Right. You know, and, and, and the people don't, don't take things into account. They're just like, well, Stardust is just depressed. I guess that, you know, God, to see a therapist, if only a therapist, you only would believe know. these things because you're sad. If you oh, God, sad, don't you Lord, God's in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have gotten into some serious uh, conflicts with people I'm actually kind of close to uh-huh. um, who have propositioned to me that um, that m- many of my beliefs are, are, are incorrect um, because I'm depressed, right? They, some of them have been more reasonable. They acknowledge it's still possibly correct, but sort of, quote-unquote, um, healthy... Uh, "Quote unquote non-depressed people, yeah, that they're in a in a better position to observe reality and, uh, and, and, and analyze. And I I wonder so deeply about that because it seems to me most of the depressing things in life, the things that really get you down, are the things that you need to be in touch with reality for in order to yeah. properly appreciate them, and then you know, do you depress as a consequence? It seems to me that." You either need some kind of just innate resilience, like my, my linguist friend has, or, their, or destiny, maybe, or you just need to be a little bit naive about things. I mean, uh, Sapolsky has this quote, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of, what is chronic depression? It's the chronic inability uh, to ignore reality, right? I mean, mm, I like and, that. Pe- and he, he, people say, well, he's kind of depressed too, and so his, his, there are people that say his views are predicated on that, and that's why he's... Uh, you know, wrong, I guess, but yeah, I mean, we we really think about that the finished product, and of course, my experiences, my lack of sleep, this and that, have, have gone into my belief system and what I view about the world. 
I could well imagine that if I had been smarter, taller, more attractive, slept well, blah, 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 that I might have never dealt with questions of uh, free will, autonomy, um, even human nature. Um, maybe not. Or at least I wouldn't have extrapolated as much from these things as I, as I have. You know, I mean, oh, that's interesting. Because, as you know, when I was young, I was really interested in zoology. Um, but I might yeah. have just sort of limited it, like, oh, zebras and tigers, I'm cool. But I never would have thought, hmm, how does this apply to humans? Um, it's entirely possible, I have to grant that, but it doesn't necessarily make my statements or the things I believe less true. Um, and to my mind, you know, I observe people are struggling to be content. It's a, it's a hard life. Yeah. You tell them By things default. that you don't, that aren't pleasant, it makes it harder. Yeah. I had I had an ex at some point in time who would constantly want me to assure her and me being me who I am I, I'm I'm not good in saying yes everything's gonna be fine if I'm not sure about that I, I, I can't do that it's not just like if I, it's just factually incorrect I, uh, and that was always an issue and I realized over time that I would be she kind of wanted me to lie to her even though she when I asked her you want me to lie to you she said no it's this weird mind game that women in particular do but you know sort of I can give you as much assurance of X as I think it is probable, but that is it. And the same goes true of, of many different things. And, and it's why, you know, I, it's such a struggle at times when I'm, you know, say, worried about you in your darker moments because I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. I, I guess I'm not capable. And you wouldn't want that anyway. You would see through that right away, unlike most people. Yeah, yeah. So the only thing is, the only assurance is some kind of probabilistic account of, of sort of X and Y, <laughs> and if you do this, and then that probably will something in all likelihood would improve as opposed to that, even though it's not guaranteed. Like that, that nobody wants to hear that. They want, everything's gonna be fine. It's gonna be people okay. People want assurance. Yeah, I mean, especially and there is a there is kind of a sex difference there where women really do just kind of mainly want to be assured and listened to. Um, which is what, and I think guys are a lot more problem solving, uh, more analytical. Where if you yeah. you tell them something, that's this is where a lot of the advice comes in. Well, have you done this? You should do this. Like problem solution. That's kind of the orientation or the way we see things. Uh, women just want to kind of be heard, kind of to vent and be told it's okay, and that reassurance is enough, um, whether it's it's on uh, shaky ground or not. So. Mm. Uh, I get it though. I think we both get it. Like, you know, if someone's like, you know, is that person going to be okay? And I say, well, statistically speaking, they're probably going to die. Like, no, they probably don't want to hear that. They're like, yeah, it'll be okay. You know, he'll push through, she'll push through. Um, you got to give a little hopium. Um, otherwise, yeah, you become kind of, um, disillusioned with everything. It, it really does have a kind of a cascade effect on, on how yeah. you view the world and, uh, I, I don't blame people for not wanting it. However, the trade-off is that, you know, problems continue to occur. Some things never get solved, both individually and, and socially and collectively. Um, again, another intractable problem I don't have the answers to. So, Yeah, I call that the um, the alienation pill. It's, um, yeah. Uh, case in point, I... Uh, me and normies, I, I just... there's I, I might as well be a different species. I... I caught myself yeah. in a situation recently um, where uh, American Psycho came up for reasons you can kind of observe. But, um, <laughs> and uh, a bunch of Zoomers, and they and I was, oh, do you, do you like American Psycho? I said, yeah, I, I like the film quite a bit. And some guy kind of snarkily says, mm, can you relate to the, the guy in the film? He doesn't even say protagonist. Well, well, yes and no. And I'm kind of in a situation where I have to unpack this. So first I say, well, you know, Nominally, the film is about a psychopathic uh, murderer who kills people, and none of them even understood the word nominally, so I have to explain this in a different way. But that, mm -hmm. I mean, if your interpretation of American Psycho is he's just a crazy guy, you're way off the mark. Now, there are others, like it's kind of 80s Wall Street culture, yes, but the reality is this is a guy who feels trapped in the world that he exists in 
uh, it's incredibly superficial. It's draining. It's boring. It's driving him insane, quite literally. Yeah, that's and right. And murder, although I don't endorse that, is the only thing that gives him some sense of escape, some sense of, of pleasure. That's really what the film is about. And, and they all were, it was, you know, there was silence, and they, they, they clearly thought I was a nutcase. There's, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Yeah, I mean, they, particularly with that movie, the the whole, yeah. uh, what what is it? Um, not beta male, the... Uh, it was a gamma basically just this, this idea that you know be the guy that you know doesn't care what happens you know put the headphones on when you walk through the office life doesn't affect you and mm-hmm. uh, a lot of younger people especially younger guys like to kind of be attracted to that type of thing which is why that movie has kind of had a uh, resurgence of uh, yeah, it's popularity. amazing people who weren't even didn't even exist at the time when i saw in the cinema just uh, memifying it right yeah yeah I mean, I memed it back in the day, too, but, it, you know, the, the meme power in the early 2000s didn't really exist. You couldn't talk about Huey Lewis and News, and they're like, oh, what do you do? Um, it <laughs> yeah. just didn't work. Um, do you know what Ed Gaines said about... Anyway. Um, yeah, no, it's... But it, there, there's that alienation, I think, because... I was accu- Today, I wasn't even accused of... Uh, you know, the, 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 Somebody said, "Oh, you sound really cold." Like, yeah, yeah, I guess because I there was this discussion about you know, relationships and 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 what have you, and I had to talk about hypergamy and a sort of mating, and normies don't want to hear that thing, that kind of stuff. No, they, they don't. no, no, no. Just, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, they're just very. I I just find. Very alienating. It's the alienation pill. Like, there are all these pills, but being having just different thoughts in general about the the very nature of of the world. And I don't. I'm not just talking about the God or the lack of God, but just sort of how I, mean, I fundamentally, twenty four seven, nonstop think about human beings as an animal. I observe them. I think, hmm, this is why this person. Like, that's just how I've I've become. That's what I've become. And it's so alien and even off-putting or frightening to a lot of people. I don't know what to do about that. Um, the older I get, the further I drift away from humanity in, in some sense. Um, because I, I, they are aliens to me as I am aliens to them. Which is yeah, why I mean, I th- most people know. do have these kind of preconceived notions of how things really are. And in, even when you want to get into discussions about how things truly operate like there's an expectation that you're going to kind of toe the line with what is the majority or acceptable opinion and yeah deviating from that it uh has major social consequences to it um even if it's done in a very polite and accurate and considered manner um people are quick to offend be offended by it uh i'm glad you fight that fight a lot of people can't and i mean you you as you said you kind of pay for it in terms of uh the unfair reaction to what you have to say um i I think that might get uh, maybe might get better in some domains but largely people need to kind of have assurance in 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 how they view the world because yeah like like we said earlier once once that's stripped away um unless you have something else to give them other than just the truth um it, it can be very um i would say deranging Honestly, it, it it will leave people kind of left exposed and vulnerable and uh, have kind of the inability for most people. Some people can navigate it, very few in my opinion. But most people will look at the naked truth and uh, be kind of horrified at it. So uh, there's, a, there's a balance, you know. Uh, obviously, I'm more on your end than uh, <laughs> theirs, but I, I see where they're coming from. Oh, I do and too. I do too. It's, it's tough. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it it's hard to explain too. Like I, I um, I pay this guy occasionally to to practice my Dutch. He's a Dutch guy, and you know, it's, it's total uh-huh. for me. And um, talking about the, the difficulty of my age of sort of making new friends or whatever. And uh, I explained him the. I can't really explain that. Like one of the big obstacles is just the way I am. Um, <laughs> remember we. I was in this uh, group chat with a bunch of Dutch people, and it was sort of, hmm, like, 
what are deal? I think I told you about it. what are deal breakers uh, when it comes to relationships or uh, you know, blah blah blah. And um, the things they said were just so super enormous. Intolerance and racism, like that would be like okay. Well, what about oh, she's a, what about she's a psychopathic drama queen? Would that be a deal? I mean, I don't know. That seems to be higher up on the just. I um yeah, and then I God, I remember seeing in the room. I said, uh, somebody brought some. Guy, what what about um, ambition or something? And I, I you know instinctually I said, well, you know, men don't really care about ambition of women. It's usually a woman thing. And there was oh, boy. really uncomfortable silence. Uh, <laughs> did I just you know did I just conjure up Satan? Is he in the? It's just. I you did step on a social landmine like how dare yeah. you say that about women I I can already predict that it's it's funny yeah. how it's gone so it's it's basically global you yeah know, with few exceptions uh, thing yeah. is thing is as well I mean I I can do small talk to a degree but it just it, it bores me it really does and um because I I'm always looking at this stuff through this lens I'm getting a little carried away here but so for example. Now, this studio called Larian that made this game called Baller's Gate 3, um, they released data on, on stats, like players, what do they like to do? What kind of character they like to romance? Anyway, so they have this, the race data, right? And like humans and elves and half-elves are all the way up there. And all at the bottom, you have half-orcs who are ugly as sin, and other races ugly. And the shortest of them, like dwarves, gnomes, and halflings, nobody plays them, right? And I'm just thinking... <laughs> okay. Isn't it obvious why people don't play ugly half orcs and people don't play uh, gnomes, halflings, and, and dwarves? I mean, they're short, and we all know there's a. We, we don't all know this. I suggested this to some normie guy, and he laughed at me. Like, oh, you, you just, you just, who, you just projecting? No, I mean, why else would they go for the attractive, you know, taller? It just makes you know. Everywhere well, you see these. Salute? What was his suggestion? I'd be interested to know what the normie. Um, that was. It's just random. Um, oh, it's all subjective. Uh, people, oh. um, no, oh, it's really awkward. It feels kind of awkward in the game because of like the way you're talking to characters. If you're only three feet tall, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sort of. That's true. But the fact that you're saying is awkward kind of makes mm -hmm. it, it kind of drives home the point. I mean, I see this kind of human biology. So psychobiology interfering with everything, even in freaking games where, yeah, you literally have millions of people playing elves and humans, and it's, I think it's barely a million, less than a million playing three foot tall halflings, you know, like, like basically hobbits. Like, why would, well, it makes sense to me. And not too yeah. far off, really ugly half orcs, right? because they're not that attractive. I mean, it, it's a sort of everywhere you look, you see this sort of thing. And the thing that annoys me about these people is these self same people, the people that are going to talk about inclusion and, and blah, 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 you know, the usual woke karate oh, yeah. stuff, all the while living out the, their own biases by not wanting to play three-foot-tall humanoids, to be perfectly honest, which I get. I'm not condemning them, but, you know, I and mean, uh, yeah, don't look to the splinter in my eye. Prediction, but, yeah, they, look to the log in your own. Signaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... I never, and never mind the fact that most people self-insert and they can, I mean, I've made a video about this. Women in particular just can, can only play games. They can, eh, it's whatever. But yeah, no, I think that um, that whole alienation feeling of alien is, is massive and it, it really prevents me from making an effort with people. I mean, I, sometimes I try, but it, it's very rough because I just have a very alien architecture at this stage. I Everything is looked at through this lens of evolutionary biology and theory and some people say it might say it's wrong, but I think it's. I find it difficult to think that it's not accurate. And well, you're also a, open to a better alternative if it exists. I mean, I don't oh, think oh, they're sure. tied to it. I've told people. Where I think you know, they very much yeah. are tied to their. Uh, oh yeah. Their their presuppositions. So yeah, kudos to you for that. Uh, yeah, and I had gotten. I've gotten. I've gotten a conversation with a woman uh, the other day about. Uh, well, I mentioned so. Uh, you know, she ha she disagreed with my contention that we're apes or animals, and and uh, and I simply asked her, what would be the evidence required for you to believe that we are in fact apes or animals? Well, I, you know, I've never really thought about that that way, so I don't need no. Like, okay, well, 
I could tell you the type of evidence I would need to be convinced that humans are special, unique, and unrelated. And, and it, it's pretty simple. You know, uh, get rid of the relationship, the genetic relationship, like DNA, man, way different from chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, um, our mating behavior, like all, there need, give me mountains of evidence that convince me otherwise. And I will believe humans are divine and sacred, probably. Um, so it's just, you know, I'm always willing to change my mind. Um, there are a lot of things I've changed. I think, I think this is also another thing that it's more of a human thing, not really a normie thing. Changing your mind, even after years of believing something. Um, I oh, mean, yeah. what, one thing is a common trope in the manosphere that's not accurate is, is like uh, women going after men uh, for their, their, their wallets. Well, sort of, not really. The problem is in the vast majority of divorces, women end up poorer, right? Yeah. Doesn't really support. The, the claims made. So, you know, I used to be, going on, right? Yeah, I used to believe something more akin to the standard narration or narrative in, in, in the manosphere. But I mean, these things, you have to be willing to change. But yeah, it, it is alienating. And I, I don't really, at this stage, I don't think I, I can change. I, I wouldn't want to. I mean, it's, it's, I had this long discussion recently as well about sort of, so the utility of religion first, which, you know, I acknowledge there's utility, but you can't convince yourself it's something you don't believe in. I mean, like, I'm, I, you can't say, I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ and now I'm going to go to church or whatever. And you, and because this guy was also arguing, you know, that, that he's an agnostic about, say, free will, but you should just tell people to have it anyway because it's more useful. And I just think, but if I don't this believe noble that. Lie kind of thing yeah well i think the no i think there the noble lie is a thing that seems to do a lot of legwork honestly it's just yeah i don't know if i can be yeah. the one like that elite that I, I don't remember the exact name from plato but that sort of sacerdotal class of people and from plato's uh republic where he talks about it they know like they're the root like the right i mentioned that the rulers think the gods are useful and, and but i couldn't be one of those people um and it's interesting. I mean, I don't. I'm going on a lot of tangents. There's a game called Pillars of Eternity, and uh, I, can't, I mean, no one's going to actually play it. And well, sorry for spoiling it, but you're not going to play it. So, the whole yeah, idea behind on. it um, is is capitalizing this idea for capitalizing on this idea from Plato, where you start off as an adventure with special abilities, like tied to the spirit world. Doesn't really matter. But so these gods, these gods, everyone worships them, and the whole game is about this this kind of secret organization that protects, uh, pr prevents people from learning more about the gods. Well, it turns out that this world originally was godless, right? And over two millennia ago, in this massive scientific experiment using so like soul energy, basically, they empowered, they, they, they basically sacrificed hundreds of thousands of sentient humanoids to create beings of godlike power, who then became the gods of the legends that people used to talk Whoa. about. Okay, and so, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and so they spend the whole the whole first game, at least, is about preventing the player from discovering the truth. With, and this organization called the Leaden Key is a weird name, um, assassinating people, manipulating people, manipulating their spirits, and there's like all this stuff to prevent people from uncovering the truth but nominally they, they did this they're called inguithans these inguithans 2000 plus years ago did this because they saw the chaos of the world when there was no unified belief system there's no pantheon everyone's arguing about what's true and what's not so it was sort of almost a, a project born of so sort of desire of sort of benevolent dictatorship now what better than to actually have super powerful beings that are effectively gods that people can pray to and blah, 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 and they'll answer and they'll say, look, I'm here. And the the proof is in the pudding that, uh, well, by, they also do horrible things. Like in the wake of the apotheosis experiment, they, they murder all the, the people that don't believe and anyone who, who knew about it. Is, <laughs> they just kill everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ob obviously, obviously they do that, right? Um, right, right, right. And then for 2,000 years... Got to break a few eggs. So. They had this one hand-picked guy called... Um, Theos, who would be reincarnated in, in perfectly every generation, so he could just continue this project, because he's just terrified. These people are just terrified. These the civilization of the chaos that they bore witness to, um, and of course, within the context, there's one of these gods, these artificial gods, 
that wants to kind of reveal the truth because he just thinks that lies are just a bad thing. He's also the god of light and hope, shockingly, in Don. So, uh, and, um, yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's this whole notion of what do people, and I think that it's kind of proven, at least in reality, most people don't believe in God anymore. Well, at least, I mean, certainly in Europe. Um, belief is kind of dissipated. We have no gods anymore. And maybe Chesterton was right, right? What, what do you believe when you stop believing in God? Well, you believe in anything. The yeah, noble lie. Yeah. You become very uh, prone to other pathologies. Um, yeah. You know, that the, listening to the way that game played out reminds me of uh, the end of Watchmen. Have you ever seen that? Unfortunately, no. Where, uh, no. Oh, wow. Okay, well, uh, I don't know if I want to spoil this. Uh, okay, I will. Yeah, uh, basically, the the end of the story is uh, they they're going after this guy who's I think his name's Osmantius. People in the comments are gonna shred me for this for not knowing it correctly, but okay. Uh, it's it's the the context is it's set up during the height of the Cold War. Uh, Soviet Union, United States is about to uh, is on the brink of a nuclear conflict, and his solution was to use a superhuman being known as Doctor Manhattan as a scapegoat by detonating a uh, uh, atomic weapon with, I guess, his energy signatures to it. And mm. I think it blows it up in, in New York, you know, kills millions and millions. And they find this out in real time, and the pe the heroes are horrified by this. And he says, you know, I killed millions to save billions. And he clicks a remote, and all the TVs come on, and it just shows how, because they scapegoated this third party, now the U.S. and the Soviet Union will come together to fight them. And... Um, thus ending the cold war and there, there's a character named rorschach who's kind of reminds me of you in in, in this context <laughs> where he knows the truth and he's he he refuses he's like i'm not i'm not letting this happen i'm gonna tell the people what you've done um people deserve to know and uh unfortunately uh, at the end like he gets he gets obliterated they kill him because they have they they think that yeah, the sacrifice was necessary. Um, the lie has to be protected in order to keep things going and to yeah. expose people to the truth on that scale in, 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 in the context of the story would be would be catastrophic. Yeah. And, and so uh, relating it back to um, the real world, yeah, I, I don't know. Chesterton might have might have been right about this. At, at the very least, if we're going to deconstruct and tear down these things, um, it would have been nice to have something set up, ready to go for other people to move into, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And people like Dave um, might be correct when they say, well, there is really nothing else. We need something external, which means we probably need religion. Um, mm -hmm. In this growing secularized world, I, I, I have to agree with him in the sense that you're going to attach yourself to something or you're going to fall probably into despair or nihilism. Uh, um, un unfortunately, like, you know, a lot, I, I don't have any solutions to this either. And once again, um, it feels like the ruling class has no interest in creating that either. I mean, they kind of no. profit from this, or at least they're in a situation where this is beneficial and they see no need for it. And why, why, why care? So, you know, you, let, you the, let the people eat their godless cake. So you don't need to impute even malice to the elites when they're just perfectly fine being utterly indifferent, right? In this game, by the way, Pillars of Eternity, yeah. I mean, one of the main Mostly, companions yeah. has a major crisis of faith because uh, he was a devotee of one of the gods. There was another one as well um, that has a uh, crisis of faith. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the problem, again, giving Dave the, the benefit of the doubt is you can't make yourself believe something you don't believe in. I mean, I, unless I'm chemically altered, yeah. I'm not going to be believing in God anytime soon. I, right. I, in fact, I, I'm extreme. I'm sure Christians think, like, oh. you know, I have recently been getting back into Jesus mythicism. I, I, I'm not even sure if there was actually a physical Jesus uh, in this case. But I mean, it, it, it's more of a kind of pet interest of mine. But um, yeah, or I mean, the only way I'm able to operate under my deterministic framework is because I got in this whole debate with a, with a Muslim guy recently about this um, mm -hmm. because of uh, lack of omniscience. I don't know. I mean, change is definitely a thing within a deterministic system. Um, if I do X, if I do Y, 
something's going to happen. I just don't know what. And, and the key there is the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge of what what is forthcoming after I do X is what still motivates me to do things, even though ultimately it's kind of it's a determined outcome. But um, I, I, we don't know. So it's it's worth right. nudging things in a certain direction. But with the God thing, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I enjoy churches and cathedrals, and I I like the music and the art and the architecture and the iconography. But, and maybe that's really what... You can't see it beyond uh, util- the utility of it. No, it's just purely, it's, it's very pretty, but... When I, I mean, Christianity in particular, as you know, I, I've spent a lot of, <laughs> from my view, my vantage point, it is just, it's, it's fascinatingly, but, uh, fascinating, but also bizarre, you know, and from my perspective of born of a, of a claim of an entity that may or may not have been around, uh, books assembled right. and, uh, that are uh, described as history when they're, like, with, with, with their, uh, probably allegor, almost certainly allegory, it's just, it's insane, you know, to me to, I could never believe in that as a cobbled together, ignoring, you know, I'm sure you heard of the apocry- the, uh, the apocryphal gospels, the ones that were dismissed, the Council yeah. of Nicaea. Like, it's like, like, that's amazing that people were able to you know, go through the motions to do that, but I'm not going to be believing that anytime soon. So, um, I don't know. Um, for me, uh, as I said, it, it's got to be just uh, down to the humans in my in my life. Uh, there's not I mean, yeah. there's nothing else that ultimately is going to motivate me to to make an effort. Otherwise, it's just sort of empty. Um, I, I love certain video games, but they're not they're not the sort of life fulfillment I think that people make them out to be, despite my my enjoyment. But nonetheless, you know. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the religious aspect is, is secondary to, I mean, why is that important? Well, it brings people together. Well, why is that important? Because people matter, right? So, yeah. Um, you know, we're friends for very uh, unusual and very, uh, um, you know, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe these are how uh, people are meeting each other online. <laughs> I guess that's becoming more common. But, yeah, typically it was – the people around you uh geographically and yeah. that seems to be a very fleeting uh possibility for a lot of people mm. so sir novak yeah. you and i were black pilled into <laughs> friendship right <laughs> yeah, we were, we were. <laughs> yeah pretty much that's what yeah, happened I, that's about right that's about right it's like, uh, because look at the end of the day even as black pill as we are it helps to find people to commiserate with i mean it it uh, Dealing with yeah. the intolerable normies, <laughs> the alienation, it, it's just you can only deal with that so much. So it's, yeah, people want to be around people that at least are in some wavelength akin to theirs. And that of course, makes sense. of course. Um, but yeah, I don't think the whole meme of opposites attract is correct at all. Uh, no, that's, uh, another, that's another uh, delusion that uh, probably has done a lot of damage to relationships. I don't even know where that came from because the sort of I don't know either. It's a thing. Stupid magnetic connect, you know, correlation know. relationships, or it was probably some cope to to try to find ways to overcome probably irresolvable differences. But uh, it's also not true. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's 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 actually the opposite of uh, it's the opposite of opposites attract actually. But uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I've never heard of a couple being like, "Oh, we have nothing in common, and we couldn't be happier." Like, huh? We okay. have nothing in common. Oh. One is a, is a gorgeous model; the other is like a five foot three ugly midget. Yeah, this just all you see this all the time. Apparently, we couldn't be happier. <laughs> yeah, this is um, right. Yeah, and radical differences between people tend to drive them apart. So yeah, it's just it's obviously nonsense. I don't know. I mean. I mean, this isn't going to happen any, any more than we're going to find some new religion that people can believe in. But do you think, hypothetically, uh, well, mm-hmm. because we do need our delusions, but do you not think there might be some benefit to just revealing human nature to people fairly early on, maybe like junior high or some equivalent, where they're 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 given to think about certain things rather than, um, I don't know, just possibly ma- magic um, fairy dust BS, right? Yeah, I, I guess the question needs then would be, if if you're gonna do that, let's just in this 
in this hypothetical and you, you teach people in society how I guess quote unquote things really work. Um, I won't be so arrogant to assume I know how it all works, but ba- based on what we've been talking about, yeah. the, 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 the problem co- becomes, okay, how do you keep these people together or at least functional socially as a community or a population so that things just don't completely, you know, atomize into, into nothing. Uh, so, okay. People have been stripped from early on to kind of see the world as it is. Well, what are you going to do to, I guess, keep a collective vision or something like that. And I, I guess that's for better minds than me, even in our own hypothetical. I don't know. I, I guess you, you could just, be, but it's also just based on how most people operate, right? Like even, yeah, I don't know. I, that'd be that'd be a very interesting experiment because the more I think about it, the more people aren't people are. Con- Do you think people are religious innately? That we are. That's we, interesting. We kind um, of are, I, I think that so, there's some. Yeah, I think I don't think it's this universe. So <laughs> I was got in this big discussion with some guy about this. That the sort of instinct that we are free agents is pretty much universal. The instinct, not the truth necessarily. Sure. However, the, the religious belief, I think less so. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people, maybe even a majority of people that have religious tendencies effectively, but they, they, they're they also people like me. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd rather worship these constructed gods I mentioned in the game. At least I know they're real. I mean, that's the whole point. Like, they're real. I'll, I'll worship them. Why not? Yeah. Give me a good life. Um, that's all I want. I mean, this is why, um, you know, when I used to play D&D, I played clerics all the time. You know why? Because the clerics actually answer your prayers. They give you spells and they uh, seem to care about you a little bit, at least. Um, sure. I look in that type of world. I would be a deeply religious person. There's evidence. <laughs> yeah. Give me yeah, the evidence, yeah. I will believe. But um, yeah, faith takes on a different uh, different notion there. But yeah, I just don't know how universal that is. I mean, it is true nominally that that most cultures have had some religious inkling, but that's just reflected of of the. There's a yeah. Most human beings have this view the world through almost like an agentic lens. There's something that went on there, some purpose behind it. I mean, we 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 see purpose in a purposeless universe, essentially. Yeah, and, and that we, we, we feel naturally to be existential. Is that fair to say that there has to be something out there, or you know, there's well, well, got, no, no. We it's have to ex- find a reason why we're doing all this. I would assume. And, well, it's not just that, Sir Novak. This is an extension uh, of our own. The humans' purpose exists for humans, whatever, you, you set a goal, you need to mow the lawn yeah. or play a game or do your work, whatever. It seems only natural as a human ape then to extend that purpose to the rest of the universe. I mean, there must be something behind this. Mm-hmm. Well, why else would we be? It doesn't obviously have to be that way when you really get to brass tacks, but I think that's just the, that's the development of religion. And if you look at the development of religion broadly, you start with what's called animism, which is kind of this, you know, the spirit in the river and the tree and that sort of thing. And and that right. eventually morphs into uh, polytheism, which are kind of fully fledged entities, which, which are, you know, very much their own personalities that, that govern different aspects of life. And this is the, the next step is in, in universal, but certainly in, in, in the Middle East, this evolution of, of monotheism. Um, which pr- was preceded by henotheism, where you have you know one god amongst many. But it seems to me that these are just yeah humans. It's more less religious and more about there's some kind of agency in the cosmos, and I will project onto that agency what I think is correct. And and in many cases, it's been a god or spirits or whatever. And um, as for monotheism, it's just incredibly useful, right? Um, you see what it's done for uh, all three of the so-called great monotheisms. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case yeah. of Judaism, it's a very strong tribal identity for them. In the case of Christianity, it's, um, well, salvation beyond the grave and the, the certainty that somebody, some god godhead saved all of humanity. And right. um, in Islam, it's the certainty that uh, Muhammad was the final prophet and, you know, that's the, the final message of God to, to, to humanity. They all sort of serve to just be glue that binds. You know, people feel, quote, community, all this other stuff. 
But it's all about sort of, you know, we're agents, so there have to be agents out there too, even if they're not necessarily. Um, and so that, I think, right. is where re religious belief ultimately comes from, the perception of an agentic world where there is none, which probably a lot of people have, myself. And, I mean, gods, I know when I was a, a kid, I mean, everyone's been there. You're young. You really feel like something bad happens to you. Maybe you're having a bad week or two, and it feels like the world is against you. Like it's actually aligned against right. you in, in some real way. And I think... Um, People need a way to explain away the tragedy of life. And yeah, that. absolutely. It, it's 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 totally absurd and, and senseless, but if you... I mean, the Book of Joe, famously, which is uh, Jeter mm. Portenson's favorite, it's just... I, I mean, I get the... Like, <laughs> the book of I, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's actually moronic. I think the book of Job is legitimately moronic. However, I, I get what they're trying to do there. The writers and and people, well, you know, suffer, suffer, keep the faith, kind of thing. Well, that that that's in a nutshell, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you will reap the rewards, you know, if you are faithful. And, I've uh, never ever heard a con you know maybe it's because I've been so 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 sedulously uh, irreligious, but. I've never in my life heard a convincing theodicy. I mean, the, the theodicies are for people who really gra actually grapple with these, who actually believe. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Job is not a good theodicy. Uh, Job is a terrible one. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm going to let him, I'm going to let Satan screw you up. Okay. Well, it's good for you. You kept the faith. I forgot. Is Job actually rewarded in the end? I don't remember. Uh, it's been a while. It's actually, yeah, yeah, it's one of the few books that I, I remember reading. Yeah. I, I think he is rewarded, but it's like, I think I could be wrong, you know, yeah. big grain of salt, yeah. but I think he's just, he's rewarded with uh, paradise. Um, yeah. But it's like family's dead, stricken with disease, yeah. Yeah. land and cattle gone. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad all on a wager. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Poor Job. I'll have to look. I forgot the ending, uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I did too. It, it's a. It's not a. I, mean, I don't know, but uh, he yeah, keeps no, I the faith. That's that's what I know for sure. Yeah, he, yeah. Of course, he keeps the faith, uh, and so God is vindicated, and because Satan is so sure that he could uh, uh, prove to him that Job. I can denounce. Would, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are a lot of non-Jobs out there. There are a lot of jo non-Jobs out there beset by tragedy that that were not able to keep the faith. Um, they couldn't find their own theodicy, which Job yeah. is not, by the way. It's not a. Um, oh God, I, 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 Christian casuistry is just so. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the, nah. Don't get me started. It's been a while since okay. I've, I've delved into <laughs> it, but it's just uh, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think it's ultimately born of this agency notion, and so oh, there has to be some divine. But you know, there are other cultures. You know different genotypes, different phenotypes that have, uh, you know, have other systems that aren't necessarily reconcilable with the, sort of the, the goodness of God. And um, to be perfectly fair, mm -hmm. um, you know what Manichaeism is, right? The sort of dichotomization of, sort of good and evil, extremes, poles. Vaguely. Anyway. Yeah. So... Judaism actually borrowed that idea of sort of good and evil, this sort of, again, Manichaean di dichotomous uh, opposite of the one or the other, from Zoroast Zoroastrianism. Um, oh. What happened was um, they, they, the Judea had lost many times, they were conquered by the Babylonians, blah, 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 and there was the, the, the Archimede Empire, the, the, the Persian Empire, roughly 2,500 years ago, maybe a little, a little less. And... Um, mm -hmm. You know, as things tend to be, you know, rumors spread like, hmm, this, these Zoroastrians are, they believe in this weird kind of dichotomy of light and darkness and da da da. And so they start integrating their own religion, totally borrowed and lifted from them. So even the, so all, whether it's Islam, Judaism, or, or, or Christianity, it's all ultimately lifted from Zoroastrianism, which is a Persian uh, religion of, in origin. Right. So it's all just bar, cobbled together, borrowing. It's, um, I don't know. It's a big mess. I, I didn't want to get on a religious tangent or religious history tangent, but it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, well, but, to tie it back, I mean, it, it's a, it's about how people are able to deal and cope with life, and how lack of direction has led to a lot of. Uh, well, it's just really led to a disaster. I mean, I don't I don't know. Mm. 
to bring it back to my own world, I don't know a lot of people who are doing well, and uh, especially on a generational level. Um, it does appear that the religiously uh, devoted are, are have a little bit better of an outlook. Yeah. Um, for, you know, for certain reasons, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Again, th- this is the other problem as we kind of uh, explore different solutions in this conversation is that a lot of it is so feels very intractable in trying to find solutions. Yeah. Um, and even in a world where we pretend we have the power to do it, 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 it I'm, I'm coming up short on answers here. Well, it's like uh, I said, lot, so go, much is all encompassing and uh, go to it's a better all interconnected place. that you got to becomes a wicked problem, really. Go to a better place, find something that might be probabilistically sure. better. I, I can't think of anything else. I mean, for the individual level. But I mean, yeah, look, yeah. you do have unique gifts. You have a unique fortitude that I admire, and 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 you persist despite tremendous uh, adversity. And um, I honestly think that will, I think probabilistically, be to your credit in the end. So, I appreciate that. You fight the good fight with a good heart, and that that can that can't be said about er- about everyone. So, um, but yeah, solutions, get out of dodge. I mean, that's. Not a solution, really. It's it's it's, a, it's an individual thing, but I'm just, uh, yeah. I think even Dave acknowledges. You know, I don't listen to him regularly because you know it's just too much for me sometimes. But the faces of the people he attends at church, you know, what do they, what do they really believe and think? I mean, are they, but although then again, does he? I think you said he doesn't just go to a church for a lease, does he? There's also... Some... No, he's, uh, if I could, he, he's brought up a story several times where I think in when he was in Seattle, he, he was at a church he very much enjoyed. Uh, he was young, he was energized. Uh, people were very proactive in their faith, and he really enjoyed it. Hmm. When he moved to the East Coast, I believe, he's kind of now at a, uh, I guess I'd say kind of a, um, from the cradle Catholic church, you know, a lot of these people mm-hmm. grew up as Catholics and, and there seems according to him, and I, I could probably, I probably would agree with this. People who are, uh, cradle Catholics are very much more content, um, a little bit more, uh, uh, myopic in, in, in mm-hmm. how they see the world and, um, not, not really taking, taking, uh, account of just uh, of where of where the world is going, and so he he he's mentioned that people who do convert are much more uh, aware of how things are going, especially with Christianity in America, and yeah. those that are kind of born into it are not really aware. And uh, yeah, he's he's frustrated by it. And uh, if I were him, I would be too. But and there's not much to do. There's not. I mean, what are you gonna? You can't wake everyone up, you know, so to speak. People, people have been trying that since the dawn of humanity, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, whistleblowers don't get a good rap for a reason. We, we, people don't want to be uh, yeah. pushed out of their comfort zone, as we discussed. So for him, yeah, I think he, he's, you know, his advice. I, I actually am a pretty big fan of Dave. I, I watch almost everything. I, 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 I respect I, I see, Dave, too. I see points where, yeah, I see points where even I he starts to lose me, too, but... Yeah, I always kind of know where he's where he's going or where he's coming from, and I, you know, he he sees that a lot of people are, I don't want to say not going to make it, but are are not going to be interested in being moved from their current uh, place in life, which, as we know, is understandable and predictable, but it yeah. is frustrating when you're trying to help people navigate uh, away from self destruction or from, uh, you know, a worse life outcome. But that's a lot of it has to do with people being open to it. And if you're not, as you mentioned earlier about, you know, people agreeing with certain arguments and positions, but they never really internalize it. And therefore, they don't really actively believe it. Hmm. Um, It takes a lot to budge people who aren't open. And so that's and most people aren't open, I would think, Um, which is kind of strange because it seems like it's. We're also very adaptable to situations too, if that makes sense. But I think it's with our own conception of the world. So, yeah, a lot of these issues are uh, very much embedded on a very deep level. 
and uh, change for the better is going to be very slow, maybe generational, maybe never. Mm. But uh, I'm not omnipotent either, so we'll see where the world, we'll see where things take us. Um, yeah, final yeah. point, Dave. I, I can, I, I always see fit to, to just overlook the religious differences, uh, and, and I respect the guy. Yeah. Um, and I, I do appreciate what he's doing, although I don't you know, watch all of his content. I admire him for his ability to argue with people in extreme left-wing positions. I don't know why. I think it's yeah. a, he, it's kind of a guilty pleasure of his. I, I think he enjoys it on some. I, I can't. It why is. else would it you is. do that? Why else would you do it? Yeah, these people are insane, half the time. Um, but yeah, it is. Uh, hmm. So predictably, uh, from where we started, we have arrived at no good solution. But I think <laughs> in the beginning, available. yeah, yeah, in the beginning we did prophesize that. We probably wouldn't. Um, there was no commitment to or, or promise of finding a solution to the, the manifold problems afflicting us all. But look, one thing I do know uh, factually is that the acknowledgement of these problems and the fact that there are individuals out there discussing them gives people something, some point of connection rather than being trapped in, in your own woe and misery, which you know happens regardless. But the, to know yeah. that other people are struggling and to know that they're, they're facing challenges is, um, it's, it's not even inspirational. It's just, it's a, it's a little beacon of light in the dark to say, wow, you know, I'm not the only one going through this. Um, because if you were to look online, everyone's just doing amazing. Like, like it's agentic people make it like, I see this in my comment section and elsewhere. There's a kind of a meme I have with my friend Lord Lord Ainsworth. With every every in the manosphere, every comment section has some six foot three millionaire guy who just decided to just I don't know check out a society for reasons that are deeply mysterious, right? Um, right. Allegedly, but uh, I think most people are struggling, and um, understandably so. Um, well, this think, is the self-extraction issue where yeah. even likely maybe in this video where people will say, uh, well, you know, I did this, this and that, and I, yeah, I've never been happier. Yeah. It's like, well, don't you know you're an outlier? I mean, haven't you observed yeah. that too? I mean, what, 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 is, what is the implication that we should do what you do? Like, oh, well, you know, I think we all know that's not really, that's not a feasible thing to ask of people, especially living different lives who you don't know. I mean... You, uh, you might have heard the worst advice is advice, and yeah. so yeah, someone someone I, uh, said that once. Mm, I, I've heard that before. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So yeah, I just um, you're right. I think that p there is some comfort in knowing. Like for instance, when I first learned about kind of the red pill, the mm. manosphere, um, I don't know if comforting is the right word, but it is nice to know. Like, okay, this is not just me uniquely. Absolutely. Uh, Stepping on rakes in, in my life, it's like, whoa, lots of guys are having these issues. And then you go a little further, and you're like, whoa, lots of people are dealing with this problem. Yep. And you get a little wider, and you're like, wow, there's a lot of people not doing well for very similar reasons, despite their own subject subjectivity yep. and individual life paths. And so a lot of this is systemic. Um, a lot of this is um, kind, of a, kind of a macro issue. And so that I think that makes it that much more difficult because especially in this globally interconnected world, finding an alternative that enough people agree with is almost it maybe it is impossible. And so the best we can do is, you know, as we said, find people, you know, that you care about and, and are willing to be part of your life. That That's nice. That doesn't solve many problems, but it's. It's I, it was something that I doubt many people would shake their uh, shake their head at. No, but and again, in terms of dealing with larger issues, people like Dave would say, "Well, you just got to find enough functional people to kind of come together and weather the storm." And that's an honest take. So yeah. yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. And if you're lucky enough to be capable of believing in some higher power, uh, by all means, do so. Um, it won't be joining you, sadly, but. Um, it's, uh, I'm glad that some people have that, uh, legitimately. Mm -hmm. um, I've never, you know, I'm not even, I've never been one of these sort of big anti, the I, you know, if I'm pressed, I'll tell people what I think, but I, I don't really see the, the point. Um, I'm glad that people have some kind of faith, something to cling to. It's, it's important. 
ultimately. And, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the life is life is not easy, and if people have ways of, of navigating their life and that make them happy, and are uh, for the most part not destructive to everything else around them, I mean, who am I to say otherwise? I don't have any solutions. So, no. uh, and best I have, of luck to them. You know? Final point of my own sort of life trajectory, uh-huh. uh, being you know a fair bit older than you, I. I just remember myself uh, <laughs> thinking I lived in, in some bizarro world. I mean, observing these things, it finally came together. I mean, the late great Barbarossa, uh, may the gods bless his soul, discovering his videos and other people talking about things. Oh, wow, I'm not I'm not alone in this weird, like, yeah. what, what the hell is going on here uh, situ- situation I was in. As I always thought, I, I, like, why? I'm, I'm kind of in the twilight zone. And that it, there is a, I mean, comfort, no, but it, it makes it a little less worse. Um, it does. Yeah, and I, I think, think so. That, and it's something. It's not nothing. So, you know, if there's any contribution a discussion like this can make, then perhaps it's that. Something, in, at least in this case, is better than nothing because other than that, you're just being offered, well, nothing uh, perpetually. Snake oil. Snake yeah. oil, nothing. Yeah, and that that's no good. So, yeah, there's that. But we've been at this for a bit uh, and some change. So I'm going to, it's getting late where I am, and uh-huh. uh, appreciate my guest, the beloved Lord Novak, joining me today for this discussion. It's been a long time coming. Hope the appreciate audience. Appreciate you having me on. Oh, well, it's my honor, sincerely. And um, to the audience, I hope you enjoyed it. I don't get around much to having these long format discussions. I'd like to have more, but it's kind of a hit or miss and they come and go. I, we'll see who we can get in the future. And, um, you know, as I usually say, do take care of yourself. I hope the gods watch over you. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out next time. Take care. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.